Good afternoon. This is Tom Gardner representing the Commuter History Museum and I'm here with Dr. Roger Wood uh, for an oral history of Dr. Wood. Roger, hereafter. Uh, it's an unusual oral history. Ordinarily we attempt them uh, in a studio with a professional uh, videographer, but we happen to be in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus lockdown, so we're not in the studio. I'm here in my home office in Los Altos Hills. Roger, where are you? I'm in Gilroy, California. In your office, kitchen? Office, yes, kind of office. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my wife calls this my pit. Hmm. Uh, but it's where I do a lot of work for the Computer History Museum. Uh, this is one of many oral histories we've been conducting in the area of data storage. Uh, Roger has an extensive background in data storage. This slide gives a summary of Roger's background and experience. Born in 1951, I guess that makes you almost 70 years old with uh, 40 to 50 years of experience in storage. Yes, I, I highlighted an area there where uh, I've been involved with magnetic recording. Yes. All the uh, time from uh, British Columbia down to uh, when I retired. So it's uh, more 40 years or so. Started in England, uh, educated in England and uh, Canada. Then uh, experience with Ampex, really not in storage, more in video recording, but definitely in a lighter part, uh, key to storage. And then a uh, long history of storage experience at IBM and then at IBM successors, first Hitachi GST, HGST, and then Western Digital. Roger, tell us a little bit about your background. <laughs> okay. Uh, as you can tell, we, between the two of us, we've carefully prepared a whole series of charts, which is unusual. And uh, part of the experiment is trying to figure out how exactly to cue each other on these charts. But uh, this is sort of my, uh, my uh, early um, journey around the, the country. Uh, so my mum and dad up there, I thought I'd find a nice little picture of their wedding day. Uh, mum was a milliner. Uh, that means she made hats, uh, typically for the uh, ladies around uh, Bradford, Yorkshire, where we live. Um, Dad was an income tax collector, which didn't always make him very popular. Um, as you said, I was born in 51. Uh, the little village or town was called Salt Air, and that's near Bradford, Yorkshire. And uh, it, the name comes from uh, Sir Titus Salt, who set up a big woolen mill there on the River Air. And so salt air. So this is, I guess, is a circular loop. But this is where I started, uh, and then we went up to uh, Cumberland, Workington, and then Carlisle for a few years. Uh, and then my dad got a transfer down to Haverford West in Wales, and I was very worried that I'd have to learn how to speak Welsh, but that wasn't necessary in Pembrokeshire. It's sort of half English and half Welsh. And uh, as I point out here, I think those were certainly some of the most memorable years there, um, probably about the happiest time. I think my family was particularly happy. Uh, my dad had got a promotion, uh, so he was in charge of the tax collection office in Haverford West. And uh, so he didn't have a sort of an immediate boss in the neighborhood, which must have been nice. Um, and we, we kind of took advantage of the situation. Haverford West is sort of surrounded by sea and, and beaches uh, around about 270 degrees because it's on a peninsula. So uh, very often he'd uh, try and come home early in the evenings. We'd all bundle into our little Ford Anglia and head off in some direction towards the beach. Uh, so th those are some of my happiest uh, memories there. Where are your grandparents from? Mm -hmm. Uh, grandparents uh, from Bradford area, from Yorkshire area. So you're a Yorkshiresman way back. I'm a Yorkshireman through and through, yes. Through and through. Very proud of the Yorkshire cricket team. Uh -huh. What was your grandmother's maiden name? Uh, my mother's maiden name was uh, Squires. And which grandmother do you want? Uh, both, actually. <laughs> okay. 
stop and think for a minute. Um, uh, one was Samson, and the other one was uh, um, oh, I f I forget that. It's awful, isn't it? I I do know really, but it don't come to, to mind. At the we, we can always edit it into the transcript, uh, <laughs> if not the video. Um, okay. And I ask you not for the museum so much as I ask you for your your grandchildren to know who their great great grandmother's names were. One thing that you're probably aware of is I, I did look up my ancestry, um, and it turns out that two of my is it sixteen great great grandparents, two of them were consecutive mayors of Bradford, Yorkshire. And it's kind of a nice story because it was uh, William Willis Wood's son and uh, Thomas Spate's daughter that must have met and liked each other enough. Uh, and hence they're in my, my family tree. So it's kind of a sweet story. And to set the record completely straight, you can look that up on Wikipedia. <laughs> right. I made a Wikipedia page for each of those. Um... Childhood interest, you must have played football. I played soccer in England and cricket, of course. Oh, and cricket. I didn't play much soccer. It was rugby and cricket at my school. And I enjoyed the cricket, but I didn't enjoy the rugby. Too you rugby. don't look like a rugby player. No. <laughs> that is a brutal sport. It is, yes. How did you get an interest in electronics? Well, that must be the cue for the next picture. Next slide. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, I started off, um, I guess it was in the days when uh, uh, portable radios had just come into vogue and they were based on vacuum tubes um, with a big 90 volt battery and a little one and a half volt battery to drive the filaments. And I was sort of fascinated by that. Uh, and then somewhere in a library book, I noticed uh, something about electronics and a picture of a triode. I went down to the local radio store and asked them if they had a triode I could buy and was told, no, we have no triodes, but here is a pentode. And uh, I happily took that away. And of course, it's quite easy to set up because you can get a 90 volt battery and a one and a half or six volt battery and uh, start playing with this vacuum tube. And uh, so that, that was the start of the interest. And then uh, I became interested in ham radio. I don't know how I became aware of it but I, could, I became interested in ham radio. And that kind of consumed me for, for many years. And uh, as I say on this chart here, uh, we came across a, uh, what I call a wonderful treasure trove. Um, all my, they call them QSL cards, which is sort of the cards that you exchange when you've had a conversation um, over high frequencies. Uh, so the, the, the cards in the picture here, I'm either proud of because they're a long way away from England, so it's a long distance conversation, or they're my best friends. The, the, the G3s are typically people I knew in the ham radio club in Bradford. Um, so, so that was a, a, a huge part of my life. I operated mainly on, on high frequencies, 20 meters. Uh, all in Morse code. On, on well, I was going to say Morse code as opposed to voice. That's Yes, uh, so it was voice with my friends on 160 meters and uh, Morse code on 20 meters, 28 one meters. How far did you get? What's your furthest uh, uh, um, QSL card you, you retrieved? I think there's one, one there from Australia oh, or New Zealand. It's about as far away as you can get. It's just about the antipodes, yes, from, from the UK. So I was especially proud of those. And as I say here, this is a huge part of my life. I spent hours and hours working ham radio. And then, uh, of course, eventually went down to the university and basically forgot all, forgot all about ham radio. Before we move on, tubes rather than transistors. By 65, uh, at least the f uh, f everything but the power should have been transistors. Uh, everything was tubes. And I... Uh, I bought a transistor just out of curiosity and almost immediately blew it up. I was absolutely furious. Um, I, I like uh, vacuum tubes a lot. And uh, of course, there's, there's a main uh, power tube that does the transmitting. 
True. And True. you carefully tune the tank circuit, as they call it, the tune circuit on the anode of the, um, of the vacuum tube. And uh, you tune it such that uh, instead, of being, instead of the anode being bright red, you tune it until it's a dull red. And that means that you've got about the right uh, loading on the vacuum tube. Really? Exciting times. They're very forgiving of vacuum tubes. And so uh, yes, I, I was not impressed with transistors when I first came across. Okay. So th at some point around 1969, you went down to London to attend the university? I did indeed. And uh, I went to University College London. And the reason I went there was because I wanted to do electronics. I didn't want to do electrical engineering because that reminded me of uh, sort of heavy duty transformers and power stations and uh, electrical grids and things like that. I wanted to do electronics. And the only place I could find to do electronics was University College London. Uh, I think in, in retrospect, it wouldn't have made any difference uh, which college I went to. They all advertise electrical engineering and of course all included a lot of electronics and I've got a note there that uh, I, I enjoyed the the university uh, time and uh, I met a very good friend there and I have lost contact with him unfortunately but he was a London taxi driver it was Barry O'Dwyer and uh, he was a mature student uh, I was just a youngster so he taught me to drive in London which was quite a challenge and in return, I helped him with his homework in the various classes we were doing together. Uh, so, so that was fun. So were you taught... Go ahead. No, I'm sorry, were you taught tubes ahead of transistors or transistors ahead of tubes when you were at the university? Um, it was, I think it was all, um, all transistors at the university. Not even tubes. Uh, certainly, we and we played with transistors and built circuits with transistors. We did not do anything like that with tubes. We probably learned them, but didn't actually practice any tubes. So I'm a few years ahead of you in the same educational uh, experiences. <laughs> um, at my school, it was called electrical engineering, even though it covered electronics. Mm -hmm. And uh, my class was distinguished as being the first class where amplification was taught with transistors mm. before tubes, and then tubes are introduced as sort of a transistor with high impedance. But you were, by, by the time, well, probably 10 years later, it sounds like uh, tubes as a curriculum uh, item has disappeared, at least at the University yeah. College yeah. in London. Well, what was of interest, perhaps, is that um, shortly before, before going down to college in 1969, uh, we got a letter saying, please come down two weeks early. Or maybe it was one week early. I think it was two weeks early. And uh, we've organized a short course, um, intensive course in programming, programming Fortran. Uh, so that's what we did. It was the uh, first time I'd been exposed to anything like a programming language. And uh, that was fun too. Just Fortran, not basic too? Just Fortran. I don't remember anything about BASIC in those days, but it was Fortran. Okay, I think at this point we would probably terminate the oral history for a time being. And, okay. And then uh, uh, we'll resume it after looking at how well we've done or not done. This is Tom Gardner. I'm still in Los Altos Hills uh, talking to Roger Wood, who I presume is still in Gilroy. How are things in Gilroy, Roger? Uh, things in Gilroy are, are just fine. I haven't been out of the house for three weeks, but I keep myself happy with my, uh, my garden. And we have chickens, so I get fresh eggs every day, which is nice. I, we're both coping with the uh, current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is an interesting test base uh, for the museum to see if we can do oral histories using uh, social media applications. Uh, we're going to resume the session at with Roger's uh, history from his uh, career at the University College in London, continuing through his first employments, first at uh, British Telecom, then returning to, uh, or actually going on to the University in British Columbia, and then his business career at Ampex. 
While you were at the university, you got married, didn't you, Roger? Next slide. Uh, yes, I did. Um, in uh, 1970, at the end of 1970, summer of 1970, we had a wonderful uh, adventure. Um, and uh, it, was the, it was the summer that there was a song on the radio called Marrakesh Express, which we enjoyed. Um, so we were inspired to go hitchhiking. We hitchhiked all the way from London down through Gibraltar to Marrakesh. Uh, we'd run out of money in Gibraltar because we'd spent several days in Paris, which was probably a mistake. Um, so I took two jobs and uh, my future wife at that time was a bartender, uh, or barmaid, I guess. Uh, the two jobs I took were uh, a plumber's mate, uh, and that was the worst job I've ever had. I won't go into detail. And the other one, which was valuable, in the evenings, uh, I persuaded the local TV shop uh, to let me repair TVs. And uh, somehow or other, they believed that I could do it. And uh, uh, I think that was re relatively successful. I got 10 shillings, I remember, per television set, about a dollar per television set. And that stood me in good stead because I worked weekends after that, uh, all through college at George's TV on, on Holloway Road. Um, and uh, that was the first um, year. Uh, at the end of that year, basically, I got married. Uh, within a few months of uh, meeting my intended. And um, just before I graduated in 1972, I had the first child. Um, How many children do you have now? Sorry? How many children now? Uh, we got three children and four grandchildren altogether. And there's a nice picture of them at the end of the series. At the, uh, the last slide has a nice picture of all my uh, kitty winks. We'll get there. Now, you didn't quite wind up uh, where you wanted to be when you uh, left, graduated from the university. Um, no, I, I was hoping to get a job with uh, the BBC. I'd always admired what they did. I was, of course, interested in television, and they demonstrated a longitudinal videotape recorder, which was quite a beast uh, when I visited for an interview, but they didn't offer me a job. I was quite disappointed. Um, but uh, British Telecoms, or the General Post Office as it was then, I was a civil servant. Um, I joined British Telecoms. And this, this picture here is a, a cross section between uh, two sister stations. These are tiny little outposts that were set up during the war uh, to transmit back and forth. So I was, uh, I was posted in Backwell uh, on top of this little hill. And on the other side of the Bristol Channel over here was Castleton. Uh, each station had about 20 people, uh, relatively self-contained. It had a little workshop and uh, there was a cook to cook us meals every day. Um, and it was all to do with testing the, uh, the microwave propagation for 20 gig gigahertz uh, uh, link between the two sites. Um, and there's some interesting things here. The Bristol Channel has this huge tidal range. And if I remember rightly, there was discussion about whether the multipath interference from this uh, specular reflection uh, would change because of the tidal range. And I think the, the conclusion was in the end was that it was shielded by these, uh, I won't call them mountains, these hills uh, in between. Uh, but Bristol Channel has 47 foot tidal range. It's the second to the uh, Bay of Fundy. And it's not really a pretty sight. Um, there's acres and acres probably square miles of uh, mud that are exposed at low tide. Um, but that's, that's where I worked for three years. Now, the GPO, isn't that uh, sort of like the British uh, FBI or NSA or something? Or no, no, not at all. Um, I think that aspect was controlled uh, probably in the military. Um, I'm not sure how, how things were organized there, but no, it delivered letters and it ran the telephones and uh, they sent me on a training course for six weeks and I was climbing up telegraph poles and going down in manholes and, and using time domain reflectometers to figure out where the break in the wire was uh, many mi miles down the telephone line. So this was a, this was a information 
transferring application. It says there a microwave of clock recovery and data. So this is digital transfer for information purposes, audio, video. Yes, uh, yeah, it could have been digitized video or audio. Um, probably not video in those days, uh, but 120 megabits per second. So that's where I, I learned all about, all about EC, ECL logic, made a couple of logic. And that was my first introduction. Now, after three years, you uh, returned uh, to the university and not in England. I did. I wanted to go on an adventure. I'd always wanted to go back to graduate school and uh, wanted a bit of adventure as well. So I applied to several colleges in North America and ended up at British Columbia, uh, largely because they offered uh, financial support, which was important, uh, but also family housing. So uh, I've highlighted there on the picture, uh, that's where I, I lived for four years, in a little tiny uh, two up, two down uh, 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 terraced uh, house uh, in the end with three children. And we had just a wonderful time there because it's, um, it's beautifully located. There are beaches all around that peninsula. And I think in the background there, uh, these are the mountains that we go skiing on in the, in the winter. Um, on this picture, that's probably Mount Baker in Washington. Um, so it was a wonderful time we had there. The children were very young, so we'd go off exploring every weekend in our little um, Westphalia, VW Westphalia camper van, uh, which was fun. Electronics engineering again? Uh, yes. Um, I, I cast around for a good thesis topic, and there were several suggested between me and uh, Donaldson, who was the, the advisor. And uh, they, they started with fairly exotic things to do with image processing and vision. And at the bottom of the list was this boring topic called magnetic recording. And uh, finally, it bubbled its way up to the top of the list. And uh, partly because there was a local company called McDonald Detweiler um, who were doing satellite downlinks. And they were very, in very interested in using a tape recorder to record their high data rate. This was a 20 megabits per second. Yeah, this was a helical scan tape recorder that your thesis yes. was on? Um, tape. Type C, I think they call it. You might try the next um, slide. And I, f I forget who made the transport now, but I spent the best part of four years working on that, uh, looking at various ways of detecting, of writing and detecting data on that. So it's a good introduction to magnetic recording. You do have a slide for us. I do, yes. Um, so this, this is uh, during the, uh, uh, these are pictures out of my thesis. Uh, so I, I became very interested actually back at, um, at uh, British Telecoms in maximal length pseudo-random sequences because that's what we used to transmit back and forth between the two sites. And these are just uh, sequences that have very nice properties, very randomish properties for testing out a system. Uh, and in fact, they have some quite magical properties. Um, uh, which basically translates nonlinear effects into linear effects with a big time shift. And I didn't appreciate at the time how important this would become, but this is an example here of an extracted dipoles, uh, which uh, certainly was widely used, and it probably is still used to uh, figure out how much distortion there is on channels. And uh, this this peak here in the... Um, this is the, the cross correlation function. Uh, this peak here represents a nonlinear transition shift uh, involved in the recording. That's the effect of uh, a preceding transition on the placement of the following transition. Um, and the, the interesting part about this perhaps was that uh, I was recording, I think it was 31 bit patterns on the left here, and I could not measure phase response, which is obviously very difficult on a tape recorder. Uh, Mike Haynes at IBM Tucson had two heads on his machine and uh, he wrote with the first head and a couple of inches downstream he read back. So he could get a phase response as well. And you need both amplitude and phase response to do this uh, cross correlation properly and get this data. So I remember painstakingly looking at his printed copy of his amplitude and phase responses 
carefully measuring them and translating them into numbers I could process. And that's where this picture came from. Uh, of course, years later, um, Mike, I, I met Mike and uh, we became good friends, but uh, he asked me in great puzzlement, why didn't I just ask him for the data? And it didn't occur to me at that time. I mean, the, these folks, when I was in university, these famous names, they were kind of like gods. I certainly wouldn't have approached one of these people. But uh, yes, that, that turned out to be quite useful, that uh, extractive yeah. diagnosis. So, so you were working with IBM Tucson uh, even, even when you were at the university and before you ultimately wound up with IBM? I, I suppose so in a sense, but they were not aware that I was working with them. <laughs> Uh, I was just looking at the data they produced. Uh, I'm still a little confused, and maybe other people listening in the future tell. Mm -hmm. Go elaborate a little more about what extracted dipoles technique means. Um, as I say, these PRBS patterns, these PRBS patterns have these quite magical properties. If you take two of the patterns and multiply them together. Um, this is in the format where they're plus and minus one each bit. If you multiply them together, you get another pseudorandom sequence, exactly the same pseudorandom sequence, but shifted uh, to a different position. Uh, multiplying two of these sequences together is a nonlinear operation. So what we're doing here basically is, is translating nonlinear effects into linear effects. And uh, this is time along the horizontal axis here. Uh, and what happens is this nonlinear effect appears as an echo uh, down here, or as a pre echo down here, because it's translated the nonlinear distortion into a linear echo uh, sometime before the main pulse. And you can also explain why these two things are large here, they correspond to different nonlinear distortions. Um, but yes, I, I became fascinated with these sequences uh, way back at the, uh, at the post office. And I still think they're absolutely fascinating. Now you uh, finished your education, got your thesis written, and uh, you didn't go back to uh, Britain, you went on to Ampex. I did, yes. I had a job held open for me at the uh, at the post office, and I felt quite guilty about not going back. But uh, one day, I think it was a phone call I got from one John Mallinson of Ampex, uh, saying he would be driving up there. And I'm never quite sure whether it was on a vacation or a business trip, but he drove up there with his librarian, uh, who was his uh, next-to-be wife. Um, but he had seen some of the publications I'd made during my thesis. And uh, basically, he made me an, made me an offer um, there and then that he couldn't refuse. Uh, and in Redwood City, and I, I remember looking at Redwood City, and I somehow had this idea that it would be giant redwood trees everywhere. Um, but in particular, I noticed that it claimed to be the best climate um, by government test. And uh, having endured England and Vancouver, and all the rainfall and the snow, I thought it would be a good idea to move down to uh, Redwood City. So indeed I did, I think in uh, probably in November of 79, uh, I was in, uh, I joined Ampex. Mallison is one of your several uh, mentors and friends at uh, Ampex? Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I kept in touch with, uh, with John a long time. I, I won't talk to this, this chart for a moment, but, uh, yes, I kept in, in touch with John. We had uh, dinner together every month or every couple of months uh, throughout the time I knew him. And actually, I traveled down to see him in Southern California just a few weeks before he passed away, sadly. But uh, yes, he was, he's a one, he was a wonderful mentor and father figure. And he would spend hours uh, explaining uh, uh, one-sided fluxes and all sorts of magnetic curiosities that he, he knew about. Uh, he was very much a physicist and uh, was a great, great teacher as well. So yes, I, I really appreciate John Mallinson. Uh, Alex Maxey on this picture, I didn't know so well, but um, I spent time um, working on um, electronics, basically, or part of the electronics for this machine, the Ampex DCRS. 
digital cassette recording system, which turned out to be one of uh, Ampex's most successful products. Uh, so it's a, a transverse recorder, and that's what this illustration shows. It's not a helical recorder. It's like the old fashioned quad recorders. The heads are mounted on this drum that rotates and the, uh, the tape is formed into this cup shape and uh, the heads scan across the tape, almost perpendicularly across the tape. DCRS had six heads on there, um, one in contact at a time. It ran 117 megabits per second in a, ch a single channel, um, had PRML on it and had a Reed Solomon code on it. Um, it's one inch tape, um, so different to the quad machines. Uh, Alex Maxi uh, designed, I think, pretty much all the transports, all the quad transports uh, for Ampex, and he, he was a well-known figure. I've gone on to the next slide here. DCRS was, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, I was just going to ask you to move to the next slide, and uh, you anticipated me. <laughs> Um, DCRS was, was unique in a couple of ways. It was the first place that implemented PRML, uh, which we'll talk about probably separately. Uh, but it was also one of the first places to implement an MR head, uh, certainly the first on tape, but it was used in a very unusual mode. Um, the, uh, they wanted some sort of confidence uh, in the recording. There, there, were, there was a unit uh, which didn't necessarily have all the readback electronics in it, and that was for airborne applications, it just recorded. But they wanted some confidence that the recording was actually happening. Um, the heads ran across the tape vertically, and so the cross-track direction was down-track here. And so there was an MR head here, uh, that has a little inset picture here, there's an MR head here, which picks up these tracks as they go underneath. And the, the longitudinal speed is, is quite slow. Uh, so an inductive head doesn't work very well, but we had an MR head here. And basically all it, all it was looking for was that there was some kind of signal on the tape that had been recorded by the heads. Uh, and it was successful in, in doing that. Um, it wasn't trying to uh, resolve anything that was being picked up. It just wanted to know, was there a signal there or not? Uh, but it was one of the first applications, probably the first application of an MR head on, on tape, although it was a rather strange application. When the, where'd you get the head from? Did you make it? Uh, the head was made at Ampex. Um, we were able to deposit permaloy, able to uh, do the, the etching um, uh, to create the barber pole structure. Um, yes, it was all made at Ampex uh, by the head department. And the ad tech department, which I was part of, uh, did the sputtering. Um, yeah, it was all Ampex, the whole thing. We also made inductive heads, um, but that, that didn't come to anything. Thin film inductive heads. No. Um, but uh, Ampex abandoned the disk drive business. Now, my understanding in tape technology is uh, read after write is fairly common, but I guess it wasn't practical in the rotating head is, is that uh, as opposed to this think, confidence here. yeah i think that's very true you'd have to put 12 heads on there so it's a comfort it was a issue of 12 heads not so much that reading after writing on a uh, yes. transverse head is yes it, this was not a what i would call a computer tape drive it was a digital instrumentation tape drive so it would be used for sort of long continuous recordings and uh, not so much for short records that would be rapidly accessed. It was a digital machine, uh, but not a sort of rapid access computer style drive. It had a computer interface, but I'm not sure it would ever, could ever have been interfaced with a, an IBM computer. So it was the applications were uh, mainly uh, military and civilian aircraft uh, doing test flights. That was one of the favorites. Uh, they went into, into submarines as well. Um, so a lo lot of interesting applications. I think at one point, um, most of the test flights were instrumented with this recorder. So it was long streams of data and therefore uh, the, the issue wasn't the issues associated with short blocks. You could 
Right. right. You have a block diagram of the uh, recorder. Yes. Um, and this is somebody I'd like to mention as well, Charlie Coleman or Charles Coleman, Chuck Coleman, he usually went by, uh, another one of my heroes. And he basically was responsible, responsible for all the electronics on DCRS. And you can see a rough picture here of all the, the bits and pieces. Uh, there's the confidence system, which was the MR head uh, up here. And this, this is a segment used on the playback machines uh, and on the record only machines uh, this this section would be uh, omitted altogether uh, but i see if i can pick out some of the, the features here um record electronics so there's an error correction code which i'll mention again in a minute um the record electronics included uh, encoding for prml and uh, the playback system um uh, where are we? Reproduce, it's probably just reproduce electronics, but the PRML channel is in here as well. And then the error correction system with the, the large delays involved. And this is shown as analog in, analog out. Um, but it was, it was a sort of more general purpose than that. So, any, any key contributors uh, that you'd like to mention before we move on? To the next well, me, of course. You, of course. So, <laughs> and you did specifically? No, Char Charlie Coleman really had the overall responsibility. We used to call him Mr. 0.1% or Mr. 10th dB, something like that, because he was a perfectionist. And it, his approach was interesting in that he liked to divide the system into blocks. And each block independently had to perform perfectly. And then he would put all the pieces together afterwards. It's probably overkill, but uh, he did a wonderful job. As I say, he was one of my, my yeah. heroes. Sounds like I even wrote a Wikipedia page on him, yeah. just for your interest. It sounds like structured programming or structured circuit design as opposed to structured programming today. Make yes, a lot of the interfaces, yeah. make sure they all yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. Any other folks worked on parts of it uh, that you'd like to talk before we move on okay. to the ECC? Yeah, let me talk about the error correction. This, this was interesting because uh, when I arrived, uh, they'd engaged Elwyn Burlakamp at Berkeley, uh, who was one of the very famous people in uh, the field of error correction. They'd engaged him to do an error correction uh, system for this uh, DCRS machine. And uh, he created one. Uh, or created a design uh, which we tried to implement and basically it was not really successful and the reason was that he was trying to do six error correction and to do that you need to implement the Burlikan Massey algorithm which needs basically a little microcomputer um, and it did not operate in real time so it easily got overwhelmed uh, when there was simply too many errors to, to cope with. So it was not very successful. And so we replaced it with this structure here. Um, fortunately, 255 is divisible by three, uh, giving 85. So you can make a nice length 85 uh, double error correcting code instead of a length 255 uh, six error correcting code. And uh, that's what we did. This thing could operate in real time uh, Roger Stennison is the person who, who put it together and got it all working. Uh, and one of the interesting features of this, which I'll show on the next page, and one of the reasons it was much more successful than the Burlakamp version. And I don't, I don't know, this probably wasn't my idea. I'm, I'm guessing it was probably Charlie, Charlie Coleman's idea. But the idea was to put the, uh, the bytes of the code word physically onto the tape in a certain pattern. And so the pattern of crosses you can see there, uh, horizontal is down track, vertical is cross track. And this is the physical representation uh, of those bytes as they appear very deeply interleaved on the tape. And the interleave uh, is very, very carefully chosen. Uh, to combat against three different types of error events that can happen. One is that you can get a scratch, a longitudinal scratch, scratch horizontally on this picture down the length of the tape. Uh, 
the next one is that there may be an entire head pass missing. That would be a vertical stripe on this. And those tended to happen and often cleared up immediately because of the sort of trauma of the head re-entering the tape as it, as it hit the tape. Sometimes they clogged and then cleared immediately. And uh, the other thing was there were lumps on the tape, large uh, lumps, like a kind of a tent pole. The, the uh, tape would rise up on top of this tent pole. And so there'd be a large, uh, relatively circular area where there was no tape in contact. And so you just had errors. And this, this pattern was very carefully chosen to combat all those three different types of, of error events. And uh, we'd feed in uh, sort of ran random errors at the error rate of the tape uh, into a, a simulation and predict a certain uh, corrected error rate from that. And lo and behold, the actual tape recorder worked much, much better than this because the errors weren't random. They were bursty in these different types of events. So it worked extremely well. So we were absolutely delighted with that uh, result. And it was simpler as well. Can we pause for a second? Yes. yes. Pause the recording. This back from the pause, uh, Roger. This reminds me of what was done in the uh, CD audio and CD-ROM technology, more or less contemporaneously. Any thoughts? Uh, on that? Yes. Yes, that, that hadn't occurred to me, but uh, they they also had a very deep interleave. Uh, I don't know if they were at about two dimensions. Um, I don't know how long their code words were, but I, I, I should try and find that out. Um, so yeah, there is an interesting comparison there. Presumably they also tuned their system to the types of error events that they, they would get. I recall seeing demos of uh, uh, drilling a hole in a, in a disc and then playing it back without, without a scratch. Uh, I have some papers on that I can send it to you separately because it's uh, okay. they were very worried about uh, the same sort of um, scratches, uh, radial scratches or uh, uh, circumferential scratches or rotary medium uh, and uh, uh, blots caused by dust and debris essentially wiping out a circuit. It sounded very much like the types of problems uh, you folks were trying to uh, resolve at Ampex and as best of my recollection is almost about the same time. Now you uh, also worked on hard disk drives at uh, Ampex, didn't you? I did indeed. Um, Ampex was trying to get into the hard disk drive business, uh, trying to mimic uh, some of the IBM products. Um, and we were set up as a small uh, recording systems group, we used to call ourselves, uh, as only half a dozen people. Um, but we set up uh, a spin stand um, to rotate a, uh, a disc. Um, and in particular, we focus on the electronics mainly. Um, and we, we felt we were very successful. Uh, uh, we called the project Project El Cholo, because one of the uh, things you try to do, of course, is to fly as close to the disc as you possibly can. And somebody had the idea that this was like a, a lowrider car, uh, automobile. Um, anyway, we felt we were very successful, and this was published at Intermag in the end, in 1984. Um, and we managed to pack 100 megabytes on one surface, which was quite a lot at that time. Uh, enablers were, Ampex was in the thin film disc business. It was a plated disc, not a sputtered disc, which is interesting. Um, eventually it, uh, it didn't uh, go into production, but it got pretty close, I think. Low flying height, of course, you're trying for always to get the head as close to the disc as you possibly can. PR model channel uh, with pre-comp even at that time. Um, long blocks, two kilobyte block length, uh, double error correction, similar to the system on DCRS, uh, just a 16 times interleave to keep the block length within, within bounds. Um, it's interesting, though, the, the sort of ignorance we had um, in that uh, I think we were very pleased that we wrote 
the entire disk with data and recovered all the data successfully. Um, you can see the errors on there. All these were corrected. Uh, this is a picture of the disk, basically. Um, but all the errors were corrected, and we were delighted with that. Um, but there was no attempt to do off-track testing, which was the type of testing that uh, IBM had uh, pioneered. Uh, they would do these things called 747 curves. Um, but we had no idea about this, so we just felt it was uh, the right thing to do was to try and write a whole disk and get all the data back. And uh, the other comment there is that it didn't have a real server system. It just had a, a single sector. Um, but it was, uh, I think it was a voice call motor, but a very low bandwidth uh, system. It was on a spin stone, so no external vibration, etc. cetera. Um, but yes, uh, we had great fun. There was a, a small team of people, and that might be the next slide, I think. Yeah. Uh, Before you go off that slide. Uh, okay. Well, or even with a slide, it, ALAR has a very interesting and checkered history in the hard disk drive uh, business. Did you have any uh, interesting experiences with ALAR? Um, well, it was it was interesting. Um, I forget the guy's name, Marv Garrison. Um, I'm not sure how to get rid of this little thumbnail thing here. Doesn't seem to want to respond to me. Oh, there we go. Um, sorry about that. Um, yes, Marv Garrison was the person behind the uh, ALAR disc. And uh, I shouldn't say this, but uh, I, I remember him being referred to as a snake oil salesman, which is probably totally unfair. Um, but uh, yes, we didn't end up with a very good reputation. I think we tried to sell discs to IBM, uh, promising that there was no chemical overcoating of any sort. Whereas in reality, they were coated with, I think, sodium stearate soap, basically. Um, and I think IBM realized that there was some mysterious substance on the, on the surface of these disks, uh, which was probably causing all their heads to crash. And uh, I think we were immediately quite unpopular with uh, IBM. Um, but they worked quite well, I think, magnetically. It was the problems with uh, the mechanical problems with head disk interface and so on. And I think they were relatively inexpensive to, to make as well, which was good. But uh, yes, they, I think they've sent a lot of samples out. And uh, you probably know better than I did, Tom, but I think somebody actually made drives with them. Oh yes, there were several uh, companies that uh, shipped significant product uh, using it, and several of them had uh, major recalls. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, I believe Maxtor uh, had some serious problems with the uh, ALAR disk, and uh, I forget the name of the company now, but uh, folks, I think it was CMI or up in uh, Oregon, uh, I visited them once, and uh, literally, I saw a warehouse full of canisters of rejected ALR discs for, as they described it, white worm problems, which may have been that sodium stearate you were talking, uh, the soap somehow uh, collected and then causes head crashes. Uh, Not one of Ampex's proudest moments. No, the rec everybody said the recording performance, the magnetic performance yes. was superb, much better than yes. the oxides co prevalent, but... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, they just couldn't reliably produce the head disk interface. And in the longer run, plated might not have been a viable medium given certain noise characteristics, but they never got there. The world went sputtered. Right, probably, probably a lot less uh, flexibility and capability in producing different structures as well. Yeah. I'm also uh, interested, you single track, single track servo, one servo, per revolution closed loop system. Is that what you just said? Yeah, so there was no attempt to do a real server system, in other words. It was basically a spin stand. Uh, it could probably have been a lead screw, but I think it was actually a voice coil motor. But um, there was no external vibration, so very little to compensate for. And I'm guessing even at that time, it was probably an air bearing spin. All right, so, so the spin stand uh, got you close but the run out from changing disks was taken care of by the uh, 
single servo once per revolution, you could remove, yes. you, you could then interchange, but still read data written at a different time and deal with the run out problem. Yes, and I think with thermal drift, it would gradually drift off track due to temperature changes. Okay, and this was the uh, rec recording channel. Yes, and I just wanted to, to mention this because uh, the tape world and the HDD world have had very different perspectives uh, on how to do the electronics. Uh, so the tape world comes from uh, probably audio recording where you want to try and equalize the signal, modify the signal with pre-emphasis and so on, to try and get it as much like what you recorded. And that typically involves boosting high frequencies and also boosting low frequencies uh, to try and get the, the whole response flat. Um, the uh, disk world operated uh, off changes in magnetization so they were trying to identify the sudden pulses that come out of the head when you get a transition in magnetic recording. So they would get pulses for every transition, whereas the tape people would think about NRZ bits, just positive or negative bits um, in, the, in the bit stream. So that's reflected in this diagram. There's a what's called a derivative equalizer here, includes an integral to boost the low frequencies, a derivative to boost the high frequencies, and a third derivative to give a, a bit more boost at the band edge. Um, and so that was the starting point. So you end up then with a binary eye. It's sort of reproducing the plus or minus uh, bits, plus or minus magnetization that's written uh, on the disk. And then that's taken uh, and formed into a ternary eye pattern ready for the uh, PRML channel after that. But uh, it's, it's always been one of the interesting points that um, talking about bits, uh, very often the disc folks would think of the bits as being the presence or absence of a pulse representing a transition in magnetization, whereas the tape folks would always think about NRZ bits. It was either plus or minus magnetization, not the changes between the bits. So, uh, as a disc, okay, that's, as, that's as a disc guy, you just blew my mind. So I'm having to process analog <laughs> in an analog way uh, your statement because you're right. As a disc person, um, we just look we look for the transition, right? Right. So, and this worked. It worked very well. Yes. Yes, it did indeed. Okay. The. Uh, Next slide actually shows some of the folks who worked on it. <laughs> yes, uh, I don't know where we found this picture, but uh, we had a little reunion um, quite a few months ago now, and uh, several of these people made it to the reunion, uh, which was nice. So if you can run through them quickly, uh, there's Linda is the secretary on the left-hand side. Uh, Vinnie Wolf did the ECC before Roger Stenison came on board. Uh, Steve Olgrim did a lot of the electronics. Uh, Dave Peterson uh, did the PRML channel. Um, on the right-hand side at the back is Kurt Halamasek, who uh, did uh, the servo. And uh, standing next to him, the young lady there is the librarian and also Kurt's girlfriend. And I forget the name of the, uh, the guy in the front there. He was a summer student, and I'm kind of guessing that it was Jim Bellasu, but I'm not quite certain about that. Uh, but it was really nice. We hadn't seen each other for like 30 years, so it was really nice to have that uh, reunion. This was summer 1980. We were all much younger. They looked like, <laughs> they looked like a very young Yes, group. I guess I'm not in that picture, but yes, I was much younger at that time too. <laughs> now, this was separate from or part of the uh, ordinary hard disk drive business of Ampex at the time? Yes, I, I think this was either called the research department or the ad tech department, something like that. And we interacted, the, uh, I think the, most of the development activities, formal development activity was in uh, Mil Milpitas, or no, in uh, Sunnyvale or Cupertino. Um, and we interacted with them. I, I remember in particular, they wanted us to make a 1.7 encoder. And uh, somehow mysteriously, the Ampex library 
had got hold of an IBM confidential document oh, describing how to make a 1.7 encoder, or at least the state diagram for it. So uh, uh, we were able to very rapidly translate that into a state machine. And I think within a couple of days, we programmed a ROM for a, a PROM and uh, sent it down to them. And uh, they were amazed because, of course, it's not suitable for a product. You have to actually design the circuits, the read-only memory of the logic circuitry um, in a real product. Um, but uh, I'd like to think they were impressed with the speed we turned it around. Ampex exited the hard drive business shortly thereafter, or even right at uh, the uh, El Cholo project? Yeah, I think it was like 85, um, they, they exited it. Um, bef before we, we leave Ampex, let me talk to this picture as well. Uh, there's another of my heroes at, uh, at Ampex, Bev Gooch, um, whom I still get Christmas cards from. Uh, he must be very elderly now, I think, but uh, he was the head expert and he had the bright idea that um, in a transverse or a rotary recorder, the head physically rubs against the tape and wears, which is not good particularly. Uh, so he had the idea of why don't we put a very thin film of metal um, and, and back off the, have, have the tape resting on the metal film and uh, back off the head a little, a little way. And uh, of course, there's so much spacing loss, it doesn't work at all. Uh, except that he happened to try it with permaloy. And uh, all of a sudden, it started working. And uh, the theory was that the head, these are all inductive read write heads. The, the theory was with a little bit of DC into the head, uh, you formed a, an effective gap uh, within the soft film that was wrapped around the. The, the drum. Um, and it, it was remarkable. He was able to record through, if I remember rightly, several mils, several thousandths of an inch of permaloy uh, with wavelengths of, of similar numbers, which is normally totally impossible. Um, and uh, I think it was Rex Niedermeyer then who came up with the idea of instead of putting the, this thin magnetic film, instead of associating it with the head, uh, let's put it on the tape, or in fact, let's put it on the disc. So we made discs uh, with a thin, soft film on top. Um, and of course, putting a, f a soft film on top of the uh, disc means that uh, nothing comes out of it, um, because it, the, the soft film acts as a keeper. No flux comes out of it, there's no readback whatsoever, until you put a small DC current into the readback head. And then this, uh, this effective gap forms in the soft film where, they, uh, where there's a saturated region. And as you turn the DC current up, uh, you see this picture in the bottom left here where the uh, response gradually changes. As you turn the current up, this, this gap now, which corresponds to the effective length of the satura saturated region, gradually shifts lower and lower in frequency as the, the effective gap gets, gets longer and longer. And the region we were interested in was this short wavelength region where you get enhanced response. And uh, it seemed to work uh, quite well, actually. We were getting good results and uh, good, good advantages with it. Uh, but it didn't work with MR heads. And uh, that was the death knell because MR heads were introduced at that point to distrons. That was the death knell, unfortunately. Uh, Ampex pursued it for quite a while, um, foolishly, uh, and even persuaded uh, DSI in Singapore to do some work on it, uh, foolishly. But um, MR heads killed it. So I think uh, you're going to tell us about some of your Lake Arrowhead experiences. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. I was so lucky in those those younger years in my career as as for having wonderful mentors uh, all around me. There was John Mallinson, uh, Charlie Coleman, Bev Gooch, Neil Bertram, of course, uh, a host of people. Um, 
and the other thing, I think it was John Mallinson probably who, uh, he, he really took me under his wing in many ways. Um, uh, he got me invited to this Lake Arrowhead workshop organized by Harvey Mudd College, uh, Jim Monson. Um, and these, I, I attended uh, a lot of these uh, over a period of about 20 years. Um, and I don't like to admit it, but this, this hairy one in the middle here is me. And uh, I think a lot of people will recognize a lot of these, these folks here. Um, I've got names underneath for those who are interested. Uh, but it was just such an eye-opener to me. I mean, there are all these people whom I considered sort of extremely famous. And uh, I was there in this very informal conference, um, sort of tossing arguments back and forth and uh, just soaking it all up like a sponge, which you do at that age. So I learned so much from all these people. And a lot of them I've kept in touch with. Uh, Jim Monson, in particular, who organized these, is still a good friend. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so it was a fun time. On, on the right, on the extreme right, uh, next to the bearded guy, which is uh, Jerry Miller, on the extreme right is Mike Haynes, who we mentioned before. He's the person who got the nice amplitude and phase response to allow me to do the extracted dipoles. And this is probably where I met him for the first time. He asked me why on earth I didn't ask him for the data rather than trying to measure it from the printed page. And there's a young looking John Mallinson at the front, in front of uh, Mike Haynes. Now, Lake Arrowhead's had a series of workshops. Did Al Hoagland's workshops replace the Harvey Mudd ones? Or are they two, no, two separate things? No, they ran in, in parallel to a large extent. I think the, uh, this, this was called the Interactive Workshop on Magnetic Recording. And uh, I don't know what Al Hogan's was called. I think this one started first. And then Al started a series with, I, th I think, a slightly different emphasis, uh, perhaps shifting towards, uh, more towards manufacturing and markets and business end of it. Uh, and this was basically a bunch of physicists and engineers uh, with probably not a lot of interest in whether or not the stuff actually got manufactured. I attended several of Hoagland's uh, workshops. They were also, I believe, called magnetic recording in some form, but you're right. Uh, there were more than just physicists, magneticians, and engineers uh, at Al's workshop. So you typically had some senior executives, and I believe Jim Porter was always there with his market reviews. So. They were the same field, maybe a little less technical, but there were some pretty he heavy technical presentations at Al's um, workshops. In case anybody wonders who we're talking about, Al Hoagland. That's, that's true. You, you, hopefully you're seeing my cursor at your end. The, the red t uh, sweater with the yellow shirt in the right center yes. last row. Uh, the Neil Bertram standing next to him, yeah. uh, one of my mentors, and uh, Dave Thompson, of yeah. course, uh, Barry Middleton, good friend, yeah. um, Jim Lemke, who sure. passed away uh, about a year ago, probably. Eric Daniel at the uh, one end, another good friend of Eric, Eric, yes. who passed away. Um, uh, sorry, Eric Daniel, um, Jeff Bate, yeah. Jim Monson. I'm impressed um, with the Alex. names. That's a young looking Gordon Hughes. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, it, it's fun. A lot of these people are still around. A lot are not, but a lot of them are still around. And I would count them as friends. And I have a, I put together a whole series of pictures, actually, probably about 15 pictures altogether, year after year after year. And with just a few exceptions, I got names by each person. Um, and you can see each person, of course, getting older and older and sadder and sadder. Indeed we are. Now, your last job at Ampex was uh, Director of Advanced Recording? Uh, yes, John Mallinson left in 1984 uh, to become Director of uh, the Center for Magnetic Recording Research at UCSD. And uh, he, he left me in charge. Do I have a slide on that topic? Next slide. 
Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, so he left me in charge. Um, uh, so those, those were heady days because I, I was being asked to do invited talks about PRMO at various locations. And uh, I got a, a promotion basically to director level, which is like a second level manager. And uh, there were three groups all together. Uh, there was the electronics group, uh, systems group at the bottom in the circle. Uh, these are all first names, but uh, Chuck Coleman, of course, was, was very central to that. On the left hand side, heads and media. Uh, so there were the facilities to uh, sputter and etch and uh, make thin film heads and uh, plated media and sputtered media uh, in that small team. Each team was probably half a dozen people, maybe a few more. Uh, and then the right, the top right is Neil Bertram and some of the folks who, who worked with, with Neil Bertram. Um, and uh, yes, those were heady days, so I, I enjoyed that. It didn't last very long, um, but uh, that, that was a, a very interesting time. Uh, and then uh, my boss was Michael Felix, uh, but he was replaced. He retired and was replaced. I'm not sure he was retired. He, I, I should say he probably was retired uh, rather than he retired and um, he was probably pushed out. Uh, but he was replaced by a gentleman from the NSA called Bill Mahuron, and I will never forget that name. Uh, I think he was brought in specifically as a hatchet man and uh, his job was to uh, uh, reduce the expenditures. Uh, Ampex is it, uh, being described as a uh, a, a, com a company of engineers, four engineers, uh, run by engineers, four engineers. I can't quite remember how the saying goes, but they, Ampex had very little interest, or at least the people I knew in Ampex had very little interest in uh, making a business or, uh, uh, or making a profit. Uh, so Bill Mahuron came in and he basically dismantled the team and I had to lay off a bunch of uh, people which was and that's some what of the saddest uh, time I came across. And that's what led you to uh, leave Ampex? Uh, yes it was, I was totally disgusted at that point and uh, that, must be the last, that must be the last job we prefer. You might stop sharing. Okay, where's my sharing button? Stop share, okay. <laughs> okay. So this brings us, I think, to the uh, end of this uh, part of our oral history. Uh, Roger, uh, anything you'd like to add about Ampex? Uh, uh, Ampex was in the hard drive drive business quite a while. It actually started in the early 70s when they acquired a Memorex spin-out. And I guess we knew, of all the people who wound up there, you and I have one Shared acquaintance, uh, Dave Jepson, who was a recording engineer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else about Ampex or? Uh... You know, you, you mentioned it, but I wasn't really aware that Ampex was already in the drive business. Um, I thought it was a relatively new venture that they were trying to replicate some, probably a 33, 3380 at that time. Um, so I thought it was a relatively new venture. I know they got a bunch of new people on board. Uh, to try and drive it. And it lasted probably three or four years altogether. Uh, probably dismantled by Bill Mehuren at the same time in 1985. Um, but yeah, Ampex is a wonderful company in some ways. And it, uh, yeah, not terribly successful. In some ways it was because they were perfectionists and uh, they knew what a good video recorder looked like, what the pictures looked like. And they turned their nose up at these silly things like Betamax and VHF, VHS. They didn't have the quality, uh, so they weren't very interested. Well, I think uh, it drove them out of business. I think to this day, uh, Ampex uh, recorders and players are still used in a professional video, and there's a business of refurbishing heads for the machines that haven't been produced for 20 or 30 years. Yes, that doesn't surprise me. So with that, I think we will end this session and uh, we look forward to a next session in a few days. I'm going to stop recording right now. Okay. 
Good afternoon again. This is Tom Gardner, sheltering in Los Altos Hills, and uh, I'm here with Dr. Roger Wood, who is sheltering in Gilroy. Uh, hi, Roger. How are things? Very good. Thank you, Tom. How are Ready you to go again. How are you doing after eight, we eight weeks of sheltering in place? Oh, no problem. I'm uh, quite, quite happy here. As I said, we have our fresh eggs and our fresh vegetables, and uh, I haven't really been off the property for several weeks now. Yeah, but we are a bit hairy as we haven't had a haircut in a long <laughs> in eight I didn't weeks. I my life. hair, especially before the, uh, the video. So today's session will cover Roger's career of beginning with his move to IBM and continuing with the various companies that replaced. Uh, IBM as its employer, that is Hitachi GST, HGST, and then Western Digital. And hopefully we'll finish today uh, with discussion of the retirement. Roger, uh, what prompted your move in 1986 from Ampex to IBM? Well, uh, as I was saying on the, at the end of the previous segment, um, I was quite disgusted with Ampex in the end because they destroyed my nice little research department. So um, I picked up the telephone and called Dennis Mee, uh, asked him if he had any jobs at IBM. And uh, very kindly, he organized, I think it was two days of interviews all together with various people. And uh, they offered me a job. They offered me a job, which I certainly appreciated. And I'd like to mention Jim Bellison because I spent many years working for, for Jim. And he really was one of the best managers and uh, such a nice person as well. And he, he taught me a lot uh, over those years. Uh, I started at the Cottle Road site. I got the little picture here. Um, for those uh, ex-IBMers, they probably will recognize Building 25, Building 28, and Building 50. And those, uh, actually Building 50 still exists. Uh, 25 and 28 have been torn down. And uh, for some reason, this cafeteria building, which I think was building 11 or 13, uh, still exists. Um, it's sort of been cordoned off with a fence all around it, and it's totally overgrown. Uh, Tom, you wanted to interrupt me. <laughs> yeah, just in interest of full disclosure, uh, uh, Dennis Mee is a good friend of both of us and uh, the author of a number of uh, seminal books in uh, magnetic recording uh, and that is a picture of a very young Dennis Mee. <laughs> I think he's 91 or 92 now isn't he? Yeah I also note that the uh, fountain mm -hmm. to the left in your photo uh, I believe is a fountain that Jack Harker walked on water on when uh, the <laughs> Winchester disk drive shipped on or ahead of schedule. Jack had threatened the management of the program that if uh, they made their schedule, he would walk on water. So when they did, he, he <laughs> walked on water across that fountain. Okay. You said earlier, there's some, there's some interesting stories associated with that. There are, are many interesting the, stories. When Hitachi took over, they filled it full of koi because that was sort of a very Japanese thing to do. But um, all the local blue herons uh, decided they liked koi. So within just a few days, the, the thing was totally emptied of koi. As I said. Uh, but as I say, that building still exists. It's surrounded with a big fence. It's totally overgrown. And the, the mobile uh, sculpture thing there is just laying on the ground. Oh, I, I don't know what the plans are for that. But everything else has been turned into condominiums yep. uh, or apartments around there. Um, so I don't know what the plans are for this building. So you said earlier you didn't enjoy IBM for the first few years. Would you like to elaborate <laughs> on that? Um, no, I, I didn't. And I, I think it's, you know, you, you, you're sort of a, um, I like to think I was at least a medium-sized fish at Ampex. Um, and I think making useful contributions. Uh, and then you come to IBM, and it's a huge organization. You're sort of starting at the bottom again. And I was making suggestions, and uh, nobody was really picking them up. But in, in retrospect, they were probably uh, tape-oriented suggestions rather than disc-oriented suggestions. 
And I guess a lot of the spin stand testing, which I was very much involved with, um, they'd been doing things a certain way for so many years that they weren't about to change uh, based on something I said. So it was kind of frustrating in, in the beginning. And you're totally sur surrounded by experts on every, every conceivable topic. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to make much impression. Yeah. You, uh, can you share with us some of your suggestions that coming from your tape background were ignored? <laughs> I don't know. I, probably one of them is the bottom half of this picture. Uh, I wanted everybody to be doing this uh, uh, nonlinear dipoles extraction, and uh, they weren't really about to do that, at least not immediately. Actually, so, offline, we've yeah. chatted about uh, the difference between a uh, uh, disk drive orientation in recording channel design and a tape drive orientation in recording channel design. As, uh, Pe pe the experts come at it from a very different perspective. And I guess yes, that's we, what you were talking about. We oh. mentioned this before at, uh, during the, the Ampex portion, but uh, Ampex um, and, the, and the tape world, and particularly the audio tape world, they, they want to reproduce the magnetization on the, on the tape. Uh, so a bit is a little tiny magnet Piece of magnetized material on the tape, whereas the disk drive world, and, and I, I guess the computer tape world, a bit is a transition. It's a change in magnetization, and uh, certainly in the beginning, the, the using the same name for two totally different things uh, causes a lot of confusion, and uh, it, it extends. Uh, I think we talked before about the equalization. Uh, that was totally different between the two two regimes. So this is one of your successes, I think, uh, uh, the one seven uh, maximum length or or. Yes, uh, yes, um, yes. I, 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 I guess IBM was very cautious in those days, and they wouldn't let me work on either PRML or MR heads because I'd been associated with them at MPEX. Uh, I worked a little bit with Arvind Patel. Uh, he was doing a maximum likelihood version with a 1.7 code. Uh, and so I worked with him. And there was a competition going on at the time between uh, Arvind and his 1.7 ML and Fritz Wiedmer and his PRML team. And uh, I think Arvind got into one product and then all the following products were PRML. Uh, but it was an interesting uh, sort of competition that Arvind, I must admire, because he was so single-minded. Everything about 1.7ML was wonderful. It had no no drawbacks whatsoever. He was a wonderful uh, salesman and advocate for his technique. Uh, and then the, the bottom half of the picture we just talked about, I was eventually able to persuade people to do this. And Dean Palmer in Rochester was very... Uh, very helpful, very interested in doing this. And I remember in particular, Tom Howell was, was involved and he was very, very skeptical uh, that these funny little bumps and wiggles in this picture were real and uh, that pre-compensation on an NRZ signal was, was useful. And this picture uh, uh, sort of dispelled that uh, doubt uh, that he had. Um, and uh, as I've said before, this has continued to be a very useful technique. You're talking about that uh, section of the pulse where the blue arrow points to, where the, uh, the yeah, that point that where piece, you, yes. you can eliminate that. That's not, that's not noise. That is actually something that could be eliminated by compensation. Yes, yes, that is a nonlinear distortion, nonlinear transition shift. So the transition, the position of the transition depends on the presence or absence of the preceding transition. And all of these things, little bumps and wiggles here, they all have a, a particular meaning. They all relate to some nonlinear phenomenon um, on the recording channel. And that's pretty and much... This... Go ahead, Tom. No, I was going to say that's pretty much been adopted as a, uh, a channel technique in the industry. Yes, it's a necessity, really. Things don't work nearly as well if you allow that level of distortion. You uh, mentioned channel wars to me earlier. <laughs> tell tell me about 
It's the war. Who were the victors and who were uh, dude, the, this, the defeated? This is, kind of a different, this is a different one to talk to. But uh, you can see the cast of characters, or at least some of the characters there. Uh, there was an idea, well, let, let me preface a little bit. Uh, IBM always used to run, not always, but often used to run sort of parallel groups in competition. And uh, in this case, there were groups, I think two groups in San Jose main site, one group in Almaden, one group in Zurich, and one group in Rochester. And uh, they collaborated or competed to, to varying degrees. Uh, but this was a horrible time. I, I especially dislike any kind of uh, unpleasantness or contention in the working environment. And this got quite bad. Um, the first mistake I made probably was hiring Lyle Fredrickson. Um, uh, came highly recommended by Jack Wolf at UCSD. A uh, brilliant fellow, absolutely. But if I'd talked to some of his peers at UCSD, uh, I would have got a different impression. Um, so the, the main sort of competition was between Lyle Fredericks and, and Paul Siegel. And they both um, were paranoid about getting credit for their work. And uh, every week or every month, every week, I think, I had to do a monthly report and try and capture what these guys had been doing. And inevitably, uh, I'd get complaints from one or both of them that I hadn't represented their work properly. And then uh, Hemant, Hemant was wonderful actually, but uh, he deserved a promotion. And uh, I bowed to my upper management. They were worried about their quotas. Um, and uh, I didn't promote him. And obviously he was upset about that because he'd been doing nice work. And that was a mistake on my part. So um, th these were people all reporting to you or some reporting uh, to you? No, and Paul Siegel was in research. Um, he and Hemant collaborated. Hemant and uh, Fredrickson. Hemant Sapar and Fredrickson uh, reported to me. Um, and then the final thing I did, which uh, was probably the worst thing a manager can do, uh, that, that hairy guy on the right-hand side there uh, decided that he got a better version of what they were doing. So he was promoting his own idea, uh, which is probably about the worst thing that the manager can do to get into competition with his employees. So overall, it was a horrible mess in the end, and nobody really won, um, because in the end, it came to pass that uh, Rochester and Zurich working together had come up with a simpler scheme. Uh, single parity check. Uh, so uh, this uh, trellis, it was called a matched spectral null trellis code. Uh, it was never used. And uh, I think they started some silicon and it was abandoned. I don't remember exactly now. So I, I'm confused. But, which, which PRML trellis code came out to be adopted in the first IBM product? Um, it's difficult to call it a trellis code. There was this match spectral null code, which probably was correctly called a trellis code. Um, the thing that finally came out was a single parity check. And the, the detector was, was designed to take advantage of that parity check. And then that came out of Rochester? That came out of Zurich and Rochester, yes. I think Zurich tended to come up with a theory and Rochester with implementation. And that, who were the folks that led that? Um, Francois Doliveau, mm -hmm. who, from Zurich, who, who passed away some time ago, sadly. Oh, that's a, uh, he's a great name, uh, was a great name. Yes, yes, he is. Um, and I'm not sure who, it, I, I assume, um, um, I, I assume it was the, the, the usual team there at, uh, at Rochester, and I'd, I'd, we come across the names later I, for some reason. Mm -hmm. Reason I've forgotten. I Rick Galbraith. Rick Galbraith. Yeah, I was struck by the uh, continuation of IBM's management process of competing teams as late as the late '80s. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was well known in the '50s and '60s and '70s that you know that was an IBM process, they'd have at least two teams competing to do anything. 
and the way you succeeded in IBM was being on the winning team. At least that's a rumor I had heard looking at IBM from the outside. And it, it sounds like, at least in recording channel, that process was continuing really into the late 80s. Right, I, I think that's right. And maybe we were supposed to be doing different things. And if we were, they were subtly different. But uh, yes, it seemed to me they were competing teams. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you bailed from this job. <laughs> Let me mention this uh, the bottom half of this picture there first. Okay. Um, one useful thing did come out of that period, and um, it was this, uh, this so-called post-processor architecture. Uh, and this is the simplest form here, the, the little block diagram there. Basically, the left half of that is a conventional detector. Uh, you, you want to really build a much better detector, but it's too complicated to build. So the idea was you build a, a simpler conventional detector that gets 99% of the bits correct. So you just got to worry about which bits are wrong. So you look at the output from that uh, uh, simple conventional detector from the perspective of the more complicated detector you want to build. And because there's only a few relatively isolated mistakes, uh, you can correct them more easily with this so-called post processor. Uh, and that became kind of a standard architecture for quite a while and it proved useful in conjunction with this parity check code uh, that they were using. So I was quite pleased with that. And then you bailed. And then I bailed, yes. Um, <laughs> I bailed because it was such a mess. Now I, I wanted to give Hammond because I, I hadn't uh, promoted him and he was uh, upset about that obviously. I wanted to give Hammond to par an opportunity to manage that uh, that group, um, which he did for a short time before he left the, the company and started his own business. Uh, but I, I decided I wanted to uh, do something a little bit different. So um, we organized an HDD prototyping group, um, putting together, focused on a, some sort of future disk drive product, uh, we picked out a two and a half inch product. Uh, we nicknamed it Viper, and uh, there's some of the, the writing and sketches uh, from, from that time. Tom Glazer was a manager of that, um, I forget what we called it. I, I think the name changed from MRI to AMRL to something else in the end. But Tom Glazer was, was in charge of it, and it doesn't seem like much of a, a deal there, but he, there was a, a $40,000 incentive award offered, um, spread among all the people involved, which was about 20 people. So it wasn't, it wasn't a huge deal. Um, we didn't make it. We, we failed the deadline. I think we got some sort of other compensation, but we didn't, uh, we didn't achieve the goals we were supposed to achieve. You have a cartoon sketch. Uh, I do. That you made of that time. Yes, it's interesting to look back on these things. I've been a bit of a pack rat over the years. I've got all sorts of funny little things like this. Uh, I did a similar one at Ampex, which I think we showed before. But uh, this is the Viper team, little two and a half inch drive. Um, the whole thing held up by Dave Albrecht, who I mentioned in a minute as the key key designer. Um, well, might... I won't go through all those names, but uh, I've got just about the whole team there, one way or another, all by first names. Uh, top right hand corner, Bill Hayter, um, was very useful and very powerful, actually. He was, Tom, you wanted to interrupt me. May I suggest you use your pointer uh, when you talk about a name <laughs> and uh, yes. fill, us, fill us in. Uh, I just would note. Um, I could spend all day on this, Tom. I don't want to spend too much time. Dave Albrecht on the bottom here, mechanical designer. Uh, Bill Hayter was the one I was starting to talk about. Uh, he was uh, very valuable in obtaining heads and media for the project. And he made himself totally unpopular by doing that, but he was very effective. I, I used to get complaints frequently, uh, but he would go, he would dress up and go down on the line and make sure that the heads were being processed when they were supposed to be processed, etc. And uh, the project wouldn't have been anywhere nearly as successful without him. 
And he passed those to Joe and... Uh, uh, yes, this, this was Joe Feng, which is another name that's probably familiar to the Computer History Museum. Uh, he was one of the people who uh, revamped uh, the RAMAC uh, in that project with John Best and Mason Williams and the others. Um, let me see who else might. Uh, John Hong, I'll mention in a moment, uh, superb uh, read write engineer, designer. Um, and uh, Greg Fries, uh, another, I think he's made quite a name for himself, uh, uh, external vibration and uh, TMR testing on this thing. Uh, I see those guys, here too. those guys on the left there are are uh, exciting the mechanics of the system. <laughs> just, just, I, I like your photo. Right. Now, so, now, a lot of people involved, but there are a couple of people on this uh, cartoon that are important right. to you. Yes, these two people in particular. John Hong uh, was a superb analog and digital designer. And uh, because of the linear densities we were running, uh, we needed a very high data rate channel. And it takes ages, of course, to make a data rate, high data rate channel in silicon. And uh, I don't think it was very obvious how to do it uh, in an integrated circuit in those days. Um, so John built the whole thing, um, analog front end, uh, 100K ECL logic back end. Um, and it was a, a huge board. You can see the board there between the two of us uh, in this photograph. Uh, far from being a single chip, obviously, but very valuable in terms of exploring those very high data rates and high linear densities uh, on the spin stand and in the drive. The other person down below, Dave Albrecht, uh, taught me everything I know about mechanical design, which isn't a lot, <laughs> but uh, he was a, w a wonderful mentor as well. Um, and. He, he basically led the design of this Bolero product. And uh, you, you probably want to correct me, Tom, but I thought it was the first low profile IBM product. And I also thought it was the first time we'd done a deep dish flat cover, as opposed to what Dave used to call the turkey roaster design. Um, but you, Tom, do you have any comments on that? Well, I believe it truly was IBM's first 12 and 8. 12.5 millimeter height. Uh, I think IBM had a 12.7 millimeter, a silly two tenths of a millimeter difference a couple of years prior to that. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the whole industry, I think, in that period went through a, uh, a war between 12.5 and 12.7 millimeters. And the, the deal, of course, was if the laptop or, or notebook manufacturer only had space for 12.5, your 12.7 was excluded. Mm. Uh, deep dish flat cover was well established in other companies, although IBM, it probably was IBM's first. Um, the product shipped was, I think, the Travel Star LP, which shipped in uh, October uh, 1994. I guess you were went off into a lecturing mode uh, after this uh, Viper process. <laughs> yes, this was a very enjoyable experience. IEEE Magnetic Society chooses one or more people each year, they're still doing it, uh, to be their distinguished lecturer, uh, as they call it. And there's a certain amount of money allocated to pay expenses and you're expected to go around the country uh, typically to the local chapters of the magnetic society and uh, give talks and uh, i was uh, selected to be the distinguished lecturer in 1994 um, and this is a list of my uh, itinerary so there were three or four trips i guess uh, highlighted in different colors where I hop from place to place around the country. And uh, this was the first time, let me move this a little bit. This this was the first time I'd been to the Far East, I think, um, apart from the Intermag in Tokyo. But uh, I was just amazed by the, what I call their mind-blowing hospitality that I received. 
at Tohoku University um, uh, in Fukuoka. There was a symposium there. Uh, in Singapore, what they called the Magnetic Technology Center at that time, and in Korea as well. And uh, each place outdid themselves um, with the most amazing uh, uh, dinners and gifts. Um, not, not huge gifts, but little, little souvenirs and tokens, which was, was really nice. Um, and that, that, I mean, that's true of all the places I went to. Everybody was, uh, was wonderful. Uh, but um, uh, in Japan and Korea, it was uh, absolutely amazing. So that, that was quite an eye opener. By my count, that's 19 cities on uh, three continents, four different trips. Uh, right. Kept you quite busy. <laughs> and, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I think and, uh, in every one of those, I've probably kept in contact with the key people. Actually, looking at the list, several of the people have passed away. but. Uh, uh, yes, I had a really good time, and the host in each location was, was wonderful. And I gather that visit to Singapore led to uh, something else. It did. <clears throat> um, as I say, I was impressed by uh, hospitality in the Far East, including uh, in Singapore. And so I decided I wanted to do something different. I was single again at that time, so uh, and the ch children were pretty much grown up, so uh, I felt... Uh, free to, to go on these little adventures. Um, so uh, I talked to the gentleman, the director of Data Storage Institute in Singapore, was a gentleman called Tek Seng Lo. And um, he, he has become a, a good friend as well. Um, but uh, I, I suggested to him that I might want to come out. Uh, he apparently checked with Dennis Me uh, to find out if I was a suitable. <laughs> A candidate to, to come out and help them. And uh, so I went out there for the calendar year of 1996 um, on unpaid leave from, from IBM. And I was employed by the university. IBM didn't want me working for the Data Storage Institute, but they didn't mind me working for the university. And there was a subtle difference in the way they were organized. I think DSI was a government institute. And there were a couple of projects, uh, both of which were interesting. Uh, the other thing I did was teach a graduate course on magnetic recording and distract technology. And that gave me a new appreciation. Um, being an ac academic and teaching courses is a lot of work and I really hadn't appreciated it. I thought somehow it was the easy life, uh, but for, especially I suppose preparing new lectures on a new topic uh, is a lot of work. And so that was, that was interesting. I've got a couple of charts next to think elaborating on each project. So it, it, it helps if you to... teach the same course several times <laughs> yes. and build upon uh, your work. The first yeah. time, as I understand it, is rather difficult. Uh, do you want to uh, say a bit about the two projects uh, that you worked uh, let on? Me, let me just make a comment about the, the teaching as well. Um, sure. It was uh, the, the students in Singapore are incredibly well behaved. Uh, they generally sit there fairly quietly absorbing what you, you have to tell them. Uh, but I remember they, they had a class foreman. And uh, after a few weeks, the class, because I would prepare these, you know, I'd be up to three or four o'clock in the morning preparing the charts for the next day. And then uh, finally, the, the class uh, foreman came up and, and uh, said to me uh, quite apologetically that the, the students expected the lecture notes a week in advance, please, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> so that put me in my place. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so there are a couple of uh, projects. I'll say a little bit more about those. Um, first one was this MDFE project. Um, what did it stand for? Oh, multi-level decision feedback equalization. And it was a concept that came from uh, Jack Kenny, a student at CMU, uh, part of his PhD thesis. And it was an idea for a very simple uh, detector, um, again, focused on a 1.7 code. Um, there's always been this, this um, kind of, uh, sort of stress between, uh, that's not the right word, but between 1.7 and NRZ, uh, PRMO-based codes. 1.7 keeps the transitions further apart, which is nice. Um, 
but it loses distance the, uh, in, in that the differences between waveforms are less than they are with, with NRZ waveforms. Um, but, uh, you know, there's pros and cons between the two. Uh, but I think everything now is, is simply NRZ recording, not, not the 17 code. Um, but this was a simple detector that took advantage of the 17 properties. It was a decision, decision feedback um, detector with certain um, changes to the way the, the thresholds were set. Um, and uh, there's a nice, nice team working on it. Uh, all those names, I think, pretty much have kept in contact with all of them, which is nice. Um, and it was organized, it, DSI was very much um, along the lines of, uh, yes, let's do this, this research, but let's make a product out of it. They wanted it commercialized. So they formed a little consortium, including, I think it's called TMI. I think that still exists. Um, doing the silicon, uh, Fujitsu was involved, uh, Motorola, I think HP was involved as well. Um, so it was quite a big deal at the time, but it was eventually eclipsed. Uh, the, the idea with the MDFE was that it was simple enough to implement easily. And the progress in silicon was such that you could implement things which were much more complicated and more powerful than this. So there was a window of opportunity, but it, it closed pretty quickly. Unfortunately, but it was a fun project. And I think they, the students there learned a lot, which is true of the next project as well. I'll roll on to the next project here. I shouldn't spend too much time on these. Um, I thought by the time I'd been looking after this uh, prototyping group that I was an expert on mechanical engineering, which I, in retrospect, I obviously was not. Um, but this was my idea that they dutifully implemented. Uh, and the idea was that um, the, the first um, major mode in a conventional actuator is uh, what's sometimes called the uh, butterfly mode, uh, or maybe the rocking mode, not for, butterfly mode I think is the best. It's basically the entire structure bouncing up and down on the pivot stiffness, on the pivot bearings uh, from side to side. And uh, that limits the servo bandwidth that you can achieve. So the idea you, here you is something of, like this. Uh, yes, <laughs> um, I'm not sure I can illustrate it very well, but it's yes, it's this this mode, sort yes. of bouncing up and down on the on the pivot bearing. So you could use <laughs> your pointer. At all, but, uh, could, could you uh, use your but, pointer to show that that on the sketch? Yes. Okay. Um, so. Uh, yeah, normally the lowest mode is this whole structure bouncing back and forth uh, into and out of the picture in this direction and the whole thing bending. Uh, the idea here was to make it very stiff in that direction and also, re also to reduce the, the excitation. Instead of having a coil back here, we had not a pair of coils which produces torque, but a, a pair of magnets. It was a moving magnet design. It was a pair of magnets, so it was mainly torque it was producing rather than a force. And also the idea was to make a, a very stiff um, uh, structure for the, uh, for the arm itself, and a sort of truss structure. And it worked uh, great in terms of uh, pushing up that, that so-called butterfly mode. But uh, in my ignorance, I guess, I, I assumed that other modes were not important. Um, and anybody could have told me that it was that this thing has a, the most horrendous rocking mode. So this magnet and that magnet, they're quite heavy. They go up and down in opposite directions. Uh, the whole thing rocks back and forth on this pivot bearing. And that, that frequency is much lower uh, than it is in a conventional design. And uh, on the face of it, it's not excited. But of course, in reality, there's enough asymmetry in the system that it's excited quite strongly. Uh, so it was, a, it was a total disaster. But again, there was a, certainly a good learning process for me and I hope uh, for the, uh, the team that was, was working on this. Uh, it was fun time altogether. I take it your team still gets together from time to time. Yes, I have this lovely picture. Um, usually at the end of the year, uh, the, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, Ex Singapore, ex DSI people in the industry in the US, in the Bay Area. Uh, so we have a little get together uh, pretty much every year. I think we skipped this year, 
I'm not sure why, but oh, COVID probably. Yeah, COVID. <laughs> probably, yes, because it's sometimes it's uh, early in the year, New Year. Um, but uh, yes, this this is a team, and uh, the key people probably I worked with uh, Yuan Xing Li, headed the um, the Channel Read Write team, the MDFE project. He's now a big cheese at uh, Broadcom. Um, mm. And uh, let's see, uh, servo engineer, uh, Sri Jayantha. I might be mixing the names up there. Uh, we're a, Siri, we're a Suri, Suriya, sorry. <laughs> I was the servo engineer. Um, uh, JJ uh, did the, uh, the um, phase lock loops. Uh, George Matthew um, did the rewrite channel. Um, and uh, I think those are the main main folks I kept in touch with. But uh, yes, it, it was a it was a great team, and uh, as I say, it's nice to have these reunions every now, year. You were, you were on leave from IBM. Uh, what did you come back to? Um, yeah, that that was something again, Dennis. Me, I, I uh, keep mentioning his name, but he's been a very important figure in my my career and my life. Um, and uh, he made sure that um, I had something to come back to. He was quite adamant about that, that I should know exactly what I'm coming, coming back to. And I, I didn't really. I should have perhaps made, paid more attention. But uh, uh, this, this, I guess, worked out OK. But uh, uh, we, we put together a, a group um, focused on high track densities. So it, it sort of covered, it spanned everything from um, you know, the, the position error signals, um, the actuator, the mechanics, uh, the magnetics. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a good, good team of people. Um, it was not very successful, though. We did quite a few patterns, but nothing was picked up by Fujisawa. And I, resem I remember being quite upset. I think there was some sort of meeting where where little groups were being ranked. And uh, Asano-san was the gentleman's name. He was the customer, I think, in, in Fujisawa. And uh, there was a, a, another team in, um, in Yorktown that was, was helping. Um, and somehow or other, he gave them an A grade. But uh, my little team, or I, I only got a C grade, which quite upset me. Um, and uh, as I say, nothing was really picked up. Uh, again, I had a wonderful mentor, uh, Craig Fukushima. I looked for a picture of Craig, but I couldn't find a picture. But uh, I learned a huge amount from Craig. Um, there's something called the TMR budget. Um, what does TMR stand for? Track misregistration. Track um, misregistration. Yes, which is, is basically tells you how closely you're following the desired track. Uh, obviously, you want to try and keep the. Sorry, yeah. Just, obviously, you want you want to keep the laser the, and point your way through it. <laughs> we could spend a day in this chart based. On I think so. I, I don't want to go in detail on this, but. Uh, and may I suggest, when you're done with the laser, you take it off the screen. <laughs> okay. Um, th this picture is too complicated to spend time explaining. The bottom line is the right to right TMR. This is the difference between the trajectory that the right head takes on the disc while it's writing one track versus writing the next track in the same overlapping, no, overlapping is the wrong word, uh, versus when it writes the next track on top of the previous track. Obviously, you want one track to be laid exactly on top of the previous track uh, to obliterate it completely. There's no separate erase cycle on the disk drive. You have to make sure you overwrite it properly. And these are the various uh, uh, inputs to that. You know, there's, a, there's a budget. You know, each of these um, contributes a certain amount to that overall TMR. External vibration is a big input. Uh, there's some steady state uh, track following uh, issues because there's turbulence inside the drive uh, due to the rotating discs, and that can cause the discs to vibrate and the uh, actuator to vibrate. Uh, also, uh, if, you're, uh, insist, if you insist on doing rapid seeks, 
which you do, uh, rapid access, which you do in a high performance disk drive, uh, you have to worry about how quickly the head settles onto the new track. So that has to be budgeted in. And then uh, the tracks are, are supposed to follow the servo, um, the, the, the servo tracks laid down by the servo writer uh, in prescribed positions. And uh, they may or may not do that very closely as well. So all these items uh, go into that budget and you can break down each one into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, but Craig was the maestro uh, at doing this. Uh, he understood this very thoroughly and uh, built up these budgets from scratch. And as I say, uh, he was a great mentor that I, I really enjoyed my, and appreciated. My observation is that IBM is the only company in the industry that actually had a track misregistration budget and published a, for its products a track misregistration report. Uh, in fact, did this lead to some sort of a, a budget and a report, which was then validated in test? Or was this uh, more? Yes, there was a budget laid out. Uh, it was the various components were measured. Um, and uh, yes, uh, when the drive was put together, uh, there was a lot of work to try and uh, bring each component into line and make sure it, it behaved as it was supposed to and met the budget requirements. Uh, yes, it was a big deal uh, altogether. And I, I think we talked earlier, Tom, it's, IBM was probably fairly unique in doing this. Um, I think they were not fairly unique, exactly unique. Yes. By definition, the only one. And, I could uh, be wrong. I, I think um, as things progressed through Hitachi um, and uh, then at, at WD, this so, has sort of fallen by the wayside. I'm obviously two or three years out of date now. And, uh, I think to some extent this this um, uh, this has sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything like this, uh, or, or anything to this degree. Um, uh, that, more. That's my experience. I've worked at some companies and I've consulted for most and uh, I've not encountered anything quite like the uh, TMR report or the TMR budget uh, that ex I know existed at IBM in the 70s and uh, your experiences that went into the 90s and uh, into the century. That's uh, IBM has a degree of rigor that uh, no one else seems to have. Yet, you know, the other folks make it work. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, IBM, uh, I, I guess it was a little bit like Ampex. Uh, things tended to be over-designed. Uh, they were looking for perfection very often. And or, or uh, maybe, maybe you should be paying more attention to the bottom line. You know, my, my experience, again, suggests that maybe IBM, uh, now WD, uh, gets it back in higher yields. Um, I mean, certainly HGST design products appear to be the most reliable in the industry today. That is, you know, yes, I'm very proud products. of those those products. I think a lot of the um, uh, the the care that IBM used to take over these products spilled over into Hitachi. Um, Hitachi, I think, used to try and emulate IBM in some ways. And so there, there wasn't a lot of difference when we went from IBM to Hitachi. Um, and I, I'm very proud of those drives, the HGST drives. Uh, as you point out, they're still the most reliable in the industry. Apparently. Yeah, apparently. Well, according oh, to measurements that we see, so presumably they are. Yeah, I, I'm relying on the Backblaze reports, which come out periodically and uh, they're based upon statistically valid samples and the uh, HTST's failure rate is just better than everybody else. Yeah, and they're uh, large samples, aren't they? There are thousands of, of drives, many thousands. Well, tens of, of thousands. Yeah. Tens of thousands. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's enough to be suggestive that there's something fundamentally different about those products designed by HTST mm. and then produced by facilities that 
were controlled by HGSD management. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see as uh, WD further consolidates whether the that uh, excellence in engineering and manufacturing uh, that historically came out of HGST will continue in products, no longer HGST products, but still the IBM family names, Ultrastar, Death Star, and Travel Star. Yes. Uh, who knows? We, we shall see. Yeah. Um, I don't know how things are organized now, but it was the heritage uh, IBM um, HGST, so that's IBM and Hitachi, it was that, that heritage portion that produced the capacity drives and uh, not the two and a half that eventually went over to the WD side. So WD does all the desktop drives and mobile drives. Oh, really? I think that's true, yeah. Well, I did, I did there to their eight WD design and manufactured, but Label, but sold under the Travel Star or Death Star label. No, no, I, I'm confusing you. The, uh, the the sort of Heritage WD, which does the mobile and the desktop, and Heritage IBM slash Hitachi, which is doing the capacity drives in particular. Mm -hmm. But you still you can buy a three and a half inch desktop drive today from WD with I think a a color name, a WD black or red or something yes. like that, or you can still buy a Death Star, which presumably oh, is okay. a, it's a WD Death Star now, but it is presumably a drive designed out of Fujisawa and produced at a facility, at least under the Death Star brand, <clears throat> whether that's a facility that was yeah, an IBM I, or I don't or know. I'm trying to remember how things worked. Because when when Hitachi, no, when WD took over, uh, HGST had to get rid of its three and a half inch business and sold it to Toshiba. So, yeah, I, I'm confused over the names as well. I, I, I'm not sure what Travel Star refers to exactly. Uh, sorry, not sure what. Desk Star refers to exactly. The, I think the capacity drives are called the Ultra Star, if I remember right. That's true. The yeah. enterprise, well, enterprise or capacity level drives are the higher performing drives are the Ultra Stars. Yeah. Yeah. So, for, uh, following this, we should had probably a joint, move along, Tom. <laughs> you had a joint, right? Let's move along. You had a joint appointment in research at uh, Almaden and uh, in San Jose. Yeah. Um, this topic of uh, offices versus cubicles has come up again, hasn't it, in, in the context of COVID-19. Um, oh, yeah. when I, when I, all, all through my career, I've had pretty nice offices uh, everywhere. Um, and uh, the, everything's moved to cubicles now, I gather, at uh, WD. But uh, at this point in particular, I had an office both on the main site, a nice office on the main site in Building 28, and a nice office up at uh, Almaden Research Centre. Um, so just uh, a bit of nostalgia there. Uh, yes, I had a dual appointment uh, working both in, in San Jose on the main site on Cottle Road and in the Almaden Research Centre, which is a, a beautiful location on top of a hilltop. Uh, the work at the main site was on conventional recording at uh, pretty much a very high data rate. And uh, I had to admit in the end that I kind of neglected that portion because the, the other uh, group was sort of doing more exciting work. I think perpendicular recording had sort of been bubbling away in the background for a long time. Um, but uh, I think partly because of the terabit per square inch paper that we'll talk about later. Um, there was sort of a resurgence in interest uh, in perpendicular recording. Uh, so we we had the group in Almaden focused on perpendicular recording. And uh, that was a lot of fun. It's, uh, we started off, we had a disc in the beginning and nothing else. It, it's fairly straightforward to make a, a disc because just, just looking at the coercivity you're making with, with bulk measurements, uh, if you maximize the 
coercivity, you pretty much know that, uh, uh, how can I phrase this? Uh, if, if the grains are too big or if the grains are too small or if the grains are not aligned well, or if the grains are too strongly coupled to each other, all of those things reduce the coercivity. So if you just aim at maximizing the coercivity on the disc, you're doing a good job. Anyway, we had uh, we had discs early on, fairly early on, and I think some of the key people were uh, Ikeda-san, uh, Kenta Kano. Um, I should remember some of the other names, but uh, but I don't. But we had discs fairly early on. But of course, we had no heads, no perpendicular heads. We had no perpendicular channel. Uh, so we tried uh, writing with a conventional ring head on the perpendicular media. And uh, you get kind of a mess when you do that. Um, but it, it became uh, apparent, uh, at least to me, that uh, we'd do much better if we flew the head backwards. And the nice thing about Guzik spin stands is that the disc can rotate in either direction. So, uh, sure enough, we uh, reversed the direction of, of the disc. And if you adjust the speed carefully, which you can do on a, on a spin stand, uh, you can get sort of a reasonable flying height. I think even at one point, we had an air bearing designed to fly backwards. Um, and it was a bit complicated. I think we had to shift the pivot point, if I remember rightly. But anyway, we did quite a few experiments with the, uh, the thing flying backwards. And it was because of the structure of the head, the, the way you make a thin foam head, you put, you build a, a slightly wider pole tip than you need on the bottom pole. So that when you put the top pole on, the upper pole on, it doesn't fall off the edge of the lower pole. <laughs> um, and when, if you run that backwards, it's horrible. But if you run it forwards, um, sorry, if you run it forwards, it looks horrible. If you run it backwards, it looks, it looks okay. Uh, anyway, that, that was fun. And uh, let me mention Wen Zhang. She, she uh, worked on, on a bunch of this stuff. And in particular, looking at some of the strange effects in the SUL. We were very worried about the SUL. We were worried about spike noise and things like that because of domains in the SUL. As it's turned out and uh, as we've, we've gone into the future, uh, the, this soft underlayer is so far away, it doesn't really do anything on back at all. But uh, when did a, a bunch of work on this and publish some papers on this, that, that was a fun time. And then there was another thing going on that uh, uh, Mike's, uh, when left the company and Mike Salo took over the perpendicular recording. But the thing I want to mention with, with Mike is uh, there was a project with Yorktown, IBM Yorktown research. Um, and the idea was there was a heater placed on the air bearing surface and the idea was that because if you got close enough separation, a few nanometers, you got uh, extraordinarily high, or you were supposed to get extraordinarily high heat transfer from the heater to the disc. Uh, so you could heat an area on the disc, a uh, large spot. It was called large spot tar. Uh, large spot because it was an area much bigger than the track width. And tar was, uh, we refused to call it hammer because that was a Seagate thing. So we called it tar, which isn't, doesn't have quite the same ring. Tar was a thermally assisted recording. Um, anyway, it didn't work. Um, but Mike wrestled with this problem of, you know, when you, when you heat up the, when you apply power into the heater, it distorts the slider. And uh, typically the slider expands and that portion of the slider gets closer to the disc. Um, so he, he recognized that this would be useful, actually, and uh, oh, yeah. tried, tried to sell it to, uh, to the, uh, the head disk interface group in San Jose and failed. And eventually he was able to persuade, um, <clears throat> I want to say Mike Kerr, but that's not the right word. Um, one of the, the and Mike Sook, he, he was able to persuade, persuade Mike Sook that it would be a good idea to try this as a means of controlling the flying height, the magnetic spacing very exactly. And so he really started this, uh, this whole mm. endeavor at, um, I guess it was HGST at that time. Uh, he started this endeavor to, to produce the, what we call TFC, thermal flying control. I don't think we were the first to do it, 
but um, certainly one of the first, and it wouldn't have happened so quickly if Mike hadn't taken the initiative on this. So these are two people that I've kept as good friends as well. So that's nice. Can I make a suggestion, Roger, that yes. when, you, when you use the pointer and you're finished with it, take it off the slide? Where is that? Oh, there it is. <laughs> you have a tendency to just leave it. And, yeah. uh, and sometimes it doesn't matter, but sometimes it sits in right the wrong place. <laughs> okay. but, sorry. We could cut this out of the video if necessary. But, okay. Uh, Prompt me for the next slide. I'm not, what it, not sure what it yes, is. I'll, uh, we'll find out. So in uh, 2003, well, Hitachi bought the uh, IBM hard disk drive division. Uh, what happened next? Yes. Uh, so it was Hitachi, and uh, it was a Japanese company. And Japan was always very interested in perpendicular recording. And uh, they were doing their own, they had their own project on perpendicular recording, which is the acronym is PMR, Perpendicular Magnetic Recording. So they were busy working on this, and it was looking a little bit more promising by this time because of these three innovations that were happening. Um, and I, I, there was a little bit of interaction with Hitachi before the merger or before the, the takeover. Uh, so I, I was familiar with some of the people involved. Uh, so I took it upon myself to suggest that I might like a nice assignment in uh, Japan to work on perpendicular recording. And uh, the key person in, in Japan at that time was Hisashi Takano, um, who was heading that project. And uh, one way or another, he enabled me to do that. So I spent a very nice 18 months in uh, Odawara, Japan, and made some, again, some, some very good friends there. Uh, I've got a little picture here showing some of the key folks. I don't remember all the names, but Hasoe san was doing the media, Okada san the heads, Nishida san the integration, and Tagawa san led the, the integration group. Uh, and it was a it was a fun time. Um, I was going to mention, I, I almost forgot, that Proto 6. I'm very proud of my Proto 6. I'm going to wave it at the camera. Here is my Proto 6. This is uh, uh, still a working drive, as far as I know. I used to use it for backup, although I've run out of space on it. Uh, one of the first perpendicular drives made. Um, well, I, I guess there are obviously five iterations before Proto 6. This was the sixth iteration. It was interesting when we joined forces between um, IBM and Hitachi that we, we'd been doing very similar prototyping projects. Uh, I think we were on the same number, like number three or number four prototype. Um, and so when we joined forces, we, we continued this. Uh, these, were dri these drives were, I think, built in Odawara, uh, I'm pretty sure, which was the Hitachi Heritage site. And uh, Proto 6 was the first one we distributed in 2004, five. And uh, I came across, which I, I showed you, Tom, I came across a list of people, these certain friendly individuals that we distributed these drives to. We wanted people who would um, view these drives favorably and the opportunity to, to look at these drives and test them uh, favorably. Uh, and I, I, I found a spreadsheet. Uh, we ranked the drives. We tested each drive rank them in terms of how many defects, I think. I'm not sure what the ranking was based on, but it was probably the number of defects on the drive. And so we had these, these drives ranked one, two, three, four, et cetera. So drive number one went to uh, Professor Iwasaki at Tohoku University. Um, I, got a, I wrote myself a list here. Um, drive number two went to Paul Frank, who headed the um, INSIC organization at that time. Drive number three went to a gentleman called Kevin Wen at Apple. Uh, four went to uh, Nakamura Sensei at Tohoku University. Five went to Mike Mitoma at Dell. And then there were others, including one to Jim Porter. And one went to uh, Barry Middleton in uh, the University of Manchester. Um, and we got feedback on each of these. Um, uh, and I think they all they all worked. Um, and we get feedback, interestingly, on how many hours each drive was being used for. 
and uh, that that was that was quite insight, insight insightful seeing how many hours each of our some of the executives were, were using for these drives for the um, higher the rank the fewer the hours <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was something like that yes it was <laughs> um but uh, yeah that, that that was interesting so i have a nice souvenir from, from that now, was proto 6 announced as a product or was not no made, no it wasn't it was never made uh, it to market the, no it never made it to market but it was uh, there was publicity when we uh, the, i think the very first drive went to uh, the head of itachi i forget his name uh, but there was a big presentation made i think takano san presented the drive to to whatever his name was um, and the same thing with Iwasaki Sensei. Um, mm -hmm. There was a big presentation made, lots of publicity about this. But in the end, we were not first to ship a real product. I think that's probably the next chart, isn't it? Are you going to tell us a bit about, uh, back up a chart, please, and Sorry. if you don't mind, and uh, put the pointer at uh, the uh, SIOX segregate and the oh. uh, other three uh, key contributions and tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, the perpendicular recording had been around for a long time, um, yeah. and the, the real the real person who pushed this was this professor Iwasaki at Tohoku University. Uh, he wasn't necessarily the first. I think uh, uh, Al uh, Hoagland had used perpendicular recording very early on. Yes, um, was but, a, that was a rusty disc and a bent and a nail. <laughs> System. Very different, yes. And but Tokyo uh, University, it was Saki Sensei, has really been, I, I called him the father of perpendicular recording because he was so persistent. And uh, Tohoku University made some important innovations. They came up with the cobalt chrome medium, uh, which is it's still more or less what they use today. Um, but there were three things that um, sort of really made it work. And I don't think any of them came, to be honest. I don't think any of them came from uh, Itachi or IBM. Maybe the Cat Media did. I'm not sure. That's that's debatable. What uh, what that means exactly. Um, the first one, the, the you have to keep the grains apart. If they touch each other, uh, then the the cohesivity drops, and you you don't get the well defined. Uh, writing process because they, you can't separate the grains easily. Uh, the segregant is what keeps them apart and the grains are metallic. The segregant, segregant is an oxide material that prevents exchange coupling between the grains. And the trailing shield head was Mike Mallory's invention. Um, and uh, uh, that um, there, there was a big uh, argument as to whether you should use a pole head for a trailing shield head. The pole head is much easier to, to build. Uh, the trailing shield head gives you higher gradients and uh, a more advantageous field angle as well. Uh, so you do get better results with the trailing shield head. Um, and then the last one was the cap media, which I think was Sonobe saying it's uh, IBM. And there's, there's various versions of this and nobody I don't think is really quite sure how how the media really works even today. I mean, today it's like five or six layers of, of material, but at that time the idea was you use the silicon oxide segregant to, to keep the grains apart as, as much as you possibly can. But it was shown very early on by Jimmy Zhu and Neil Bertram and others that you did want a certain amount of exchange coupling, but the question was how to control it and how to make it uniform. And that's where the cap came in. So you kept the grains underneath as, as best segregated as you could. And you put a thin cap layer on it to provide a very controlled amount of coupling between the grains. And uh, those three things more or less came together and really made the media look very promising, the media and the head look, look very promising all of a sudden. So when did the HGST ship the first perpendicular product? I think it was 2005, wasn't it? Yeah, that's the next chart. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that was a uh, very exciting time, really. Um, this was eventually made into a product. Saruga was the internal code name for the drive. It was a two and a half inch drive. Um, 
it was the uh, that was the first HGST drive. But unfortunately, again, we all seem to be beaten to the the, the, the post with this. Um, uh, Toshiba shipped first with, a, I believe, a not terribly successful product that uh, suffered from corrosion issues. And then Seagate shipped uh, in bulk with a successful drive. Um, but I think uh, our drive, I think, was designed with low cost and it did have high reliability as well. So I think um, it's easy for me to say this, but I think we had the best, most reliable drive, uh, lowest cost drive probably out of the, the three vendors. And some of the key characters there, there's a photograph from our Saruga celebration party held in San Jose. And uh, I've still got the, the little laser pointer in the wrong place, haven't it? Terashima san, um, Mohammed Mirazamani, media, Ogasawara san at the program. And unfortunately, you can't really see you, men, but um, he, he looked after the heads in San Jose. The heads eventually were built in, in San Jose. And uh, yeah, that was a great time. Uh, it was the beginning of a very successful series of products, many of which were actually shipped ahead of the prescribed schedule, uh, which was very unusual in the, in the business at that time. Yeah. Um, and then my main job when I came back to, uh, to uh, San Jose was, was to, uh, uh, was to uh, coordinate the interactions between San Jose and Japan on the perpendicular products. And uh, that was fine, except that um, the, the worst part of the job was typically I, I ended up writing the meeting minutes and trying to transcribe from my scribbled notes during the meeting into a, a coherent story um, every week. Uh, ruined many of my weekends because it used to take me ages to uh, agonize about how, how exactly to phrase these things go very often there were action items for various people in there and you want to make sure that you're ascribing it to the right person and the right action item exactly um, but nevertheless it was a very uh, uh, very successful time for, uh, for, the, for the company yeah, my understanding is that product was the uh, Travel Star 5K160. Which... <laughs> you're, you're better at these things than I am, Tom. Yeah, I have this uh, just need yep. to have these simple facts correct. Uh, yes, good. You've always spent time giving talks and organizing conferences, even while you were pushing back technology. Uh, what let, What drew you to that? Yes, I've been lucky actually in that generally the companies I work for have allowed me to do this. So I should uh, express that appreciation. Um, but I, I've always in, enjoyed that. I, I think, it, you know, there's nothing nicer than being able to talk about a subject that, uh, perhaps immodestly saying that, you talk about some subject that you have some expertise in or you think you have some expertise in. Um, and it's often fun. You can often make uh, try and make the the talk as interesting and enjoyable as possible, as well as conveying the, the technical information. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, presentations and short courses and things like that. Uh, I wrote a lot of uh, technical papers, and again, I was uh, grateful for the companies for allowing me to do that because a lot of companies aren't quite so open with stuff like that. Um, I was in the Magnetic, Magnetic Society. Almost all these papers are published in uh, IEEE Transmag, Transactions on Magnetics. Um, and the, I, I was the general uh, chairman of these two conferences. So this is the Intermag in Nagoya in Japan. And uh, this one, uh, with two of my good friends, uh, was TMRC in, uh, in uh, Tokyo in uh, 2013 and TMRC it stands for the magnetic recording conference and it's an annual conference with a small group of about uh, 200 people or so uh, specialized in magnetic recording as you can imagine and um, these were the two of the good friends um, Shiroshi San I think was co-chair with me the Japanese and American chairs and Moreo Kasense, I imagine, was the uh, 
probably the program chairman. And I should mention, Mareoka san is wonderful. Uh, I ran into trouble with this conference, uh, the Intermag in Japan, uh, that one of the publication chairmen wasn't able to perform. I think he, he got quite ill. Um, and at the last minute, things were really falling behind. And at the last minute, Maroka sensei uh, stepped in and took over the job and did a wonderful job, uh, as he always does. So he, he, both of these gentlemen have remained uh, good friends. So yes, uh, I've enjoyed doing that. It's been one of the highlights during my career. Now there's something called TDMR that's been deployed in drives for the past few years. You've been involved with it. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, there was an organization called INSIC, um, which I've got to try and remember what it stands for, International Storage Industry Consortium, uh, which was a combination of uh, universities and industry, basically a way of funneling money from industry into universities in such a way that it would be uh, employed usefully towards doing research on magnetic recording. And uh, there, there was, uh, I think even at that time, there was probably Hammer, certainly Hammer, and probably Mammer, microwave-assisted recording. Hammer is, is heat-assisted magnetic recording. Uh, Mammer is microwave-assisted magnetic recording from Jimmy Zhu at CMU. Um, and there was a little group um, set, up, set up to look at what other alternatives might there be to hammer and mamma and we looked at various things but we came up with something called tdmr two-dimensional magnetic recording and there's a little illustration here um basically it's shingled writing uh which ne neither of these concepts was really new but it was sort of put together in a, in a package shingled recording uh which i'll explain in a minute and then uh, two-dimensional readback, which is basically reading that with an array of heads or an array of, of passes, and some pretty fancy two-dimensional signal processing to, to get the signals back. And uh, we uh, made presentations. This is the uh, one of the INSIC meetings, uh, which uh, was, a, a, again, it's a fun topic because it's so focused on magnetic recording and hard disk drives. Um, so very enjoyable meetings, uh, typically held locally, um, Santa Clara or Monterey on some occasions. So I'm not sure what the next chart, I won't try to explain any more of that, but what's the next chart? <laughs> oh, here we are. <laughs> Why didn't it work out? <laughs> Why didn't it, it work it out? Work? It's, yeah, it's been, it's been implemented in drives. Uh, I think probably all the, the hand drives. Uh, but it, it didn't work out. It, the, the two papers, one was called uh, uh, Terabit Per Square Inch, Feasibility of Terabit Per Square Inch. Um, and we'll talk about that, I suppose, in a moment. Um, so I, uh, I guess, buoyed by the success of that paper, I wrote another paper uh, with some collaborators in this case on uh, 10 terabits per square inch. And... Uh, using TDMR. So this is the paper, the seminal paper on, on TDMR. And uh, it's about as far from the truth as you can possibly imagine. And shingled recording um, doesn't work as well as you'd hope, largely because you, you don't particularly get improved field gradients and you end up with a lot of noise between the tracks. Uh, so it's not much better than conventional recording. It is a little bit better, but not much better than conventional writing. Yeah. Um, that was sort of my impression, and, and uh, when I look at your three points at the bottom part of your slide, it's the one at the bottom that is tended to dominate everything. Yes, the, I, I suppose the idea of shingle recording or the shingle writing head was that you could get higher fields, and therefore could make smaller, higher coercivity grains in the recording medium. And I think they're still trying to do that, basically. I, I think the, the grain size has sort of, sort of settled down at uh, eight nanometer grain pitch. And it's been like that probably for the last 10 years. Uh, it certainly hasn't changed very much. So as I say, it's uh, again, it's, a, it's surprisingly a highly cited paper. Both of those papers have well over 500 citations each. Um, but um, 
that, that second paper was kind of a joke in the end. Yeah, your first, Sadly, your first paper, which we'll talk about a bit in a bit, yeah. uh, turned out to be quite seminal. Uh, and, and I think, you know, this one, uh, I mean, if, if in fact shingle, or excuse me, uh, TDMR, the, the shingle writing allowed the higher coercivity, why didn't the bits get less than eight nanometers? You know, um, you really I don't think anybody fully, fully understands that there was, there was a very um, intense effort at um, HGST and WD as well to to create media with smaller grains um, using some very sophisticated techniques to do that. Um, but I think inevitably, uh, as you go to these smaller grains, it's difficult to control the, the properties. Um, and, uh, and I'm not saying that correctly, but the, the sigmas, the, the, the variation from grain to grain um, tends to get worse and worse. You want all the grains to be uniform in, in coercivity and magnetization and orientation and everything else and coupling to the adjacent grains. So and uh, that seems to get worse as you make the grains smaller. Okay. So eight nanometers seems to be about the best size. We will talk more about that when we get to your one terabit <laughs> per square inch <laughs> paper. Uh, grain size is the current uh, bogeyman of magnetic recording. Yes, yes it is. But anyhow, uh, how did things change in when in 2013 uh, uh, Tachi sold HGST to Western Digital? At this one, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, not a lot of change, um, at least from, from my viewpoint. And this was because of the Chinese government, uh, amazingly. Uh, uh, they had to get permission both from the U.S. government, I guess that from the various governments that they sold products into or manufactured at, they had to get various permissions for this merger because it reduced the number of, of uh, people selling disk drives. Um, so uh, um, the Chinese government in its wisdom said, no, you can't combine forces. And eventually they negotiated that, yes, you can combine forces, but the two halves of the company have to remain separate. So for a long time, uh, we were, what was the phrase? Um, there, was a, there was a whole separate decree from the Chinese government, uh, which we followed. And that, I think that lasted for several years, uh, during which time HGST was pretty much intact. And we weren't allowed to talk to the other half of the company. Um, and I think that continued, it, it was relaxed a bit that in the end, I think the two halves could talk to each other, except for the marketing departments, which had to be separate. <laughs> and then finally, the two companies merged, obviously, completely. And that's the, that's the situation. That's quite today. recent. That's the removal of the constraint is like within the last year or two. Two, probably, yes. Yeah, so that, actually, it was just about when I left. So it was two and a half years ago. Okay, now I got us a little bit out of out of order because I think there's something that you're <laughs> quite a bit proud of, and you have to back up one slide. I will. Yes, don't want to yes. don't want to miss this. <laughs> yes, I'm very proud of having received the IEEE Magnetic Society Achievement Award. So if this if this isn't an opportunity to blow my own trumpet. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to blow my own trumpet at this point. Um, so I, I was delighted. As I, I received the award at Intermag in Sacramento. And I gave a little talk uh, thanking Malenson and Neil Bertram in particular for being such wonderful mentors. Unfortunately, Neil wasn't there. He walked out uh, before I gave my little speech, but uh, don't mind. Um, but uh, one thing I really appreciated, uh, Shiro Ishisan, who I mentioned uh, as co-chair on that TMRC conference, uh, he, he organized this little uh, handwritten certificate uh, from the Odawara team. And I was so touched by that. I thought it was a really nice thing to do. And there's a little gift alongside it as well, which, I, which I've got. But uh, that personal touch, I think, makes all the difference. It's all very well having a a nice award and standing up at a big conference and 
receiving the award. But uh, little things like this make all the difference, don't they? And uh, I count Shira Ishisana uh, as, again as one of my good friends. So thank you, Shira Ishisana, if you ever see this. Now that goes all the way back to your Ampex folks, doesn't it? Uh, oh, yes. Melanson, yeah. uh, John Melanson was... Uh, I kind of think of uh, John Mallinson um, and Dennis Mead in, in, in some ways in the same vein. I'm sure they wouldn't like either of them to be um, lumped together because they're very, very different characters. John has passed away, sadly. Uh, but they both made had a huge influence on, on my life in, in various ways. Uh, both very good mentors and both um, had key roles in the sort of direction of, of my career as well um so yes <laughs> very different personalities between the two of them so now we're going to talk about uh, shingled magnetic recording um next slide yes uh, just briefly on this picture I, I, I had a very good last few years with uh, uh, working with the rochester channel team uh, very productive so it started with uh, waveform combining uh, and soft track ECC, shingle magnetic recording, two dimensional magnetic recording. So waveform combining was really the precursor to, do, to two dimensional magnetic recording. And again, it was, it was something that was meeted, uh, greeted with a certain amount of skepticism. Um, that's this first bullet here. Um, the, the idea that you could take waveforms from the reed head placed in two different positions cross track and usefully combine them to get a stronger better signal uh, wasn't that obvious and uh, there was a a lot of work done with that uh, taking waveforms very carefully on a spin stand at various cross track positions and it's so funny really because we had uh, uh, there are a couple of technicians, um, Jana Jarrell, I remember, and Helen, Helen's last name I've forgotten, but uh, they would sit at the spin stand for hour after hour, incrementing the reed head across the width of the track and capturing waveforms. And it was gigabytes of waveforms. Um, and to actually uh, transmit them to Rochester where the processing was to be done, we found in the end, it was quicker. So they had to finish making the measurements by 4 p.m., at which time I would pick up the flash stick from them. I would zoom across to the FedEx office close by, give it to them. They would ship it overnight. And by 8 a.m. the next morning, Rick Galbraith at his home would receive this uh, FedEx package with all the data in it. And I guess at that time, it was the quickest uh, way of, of transmitting gigabytes of data. Uh, but that went on for, uh, for many months, uh, this, this process. And uh, so this waveform combining was, was included into the error recovery procedure. That's where it first appeared. But of course, it was an important part of the, the two-dimensional magnetic recording subsequently as well. And then soft track ECC. Um, now, in, in retrospect, it's an obvious idea, but uh, with LDPC, um, you you know whether or not a, a data block is good or bad. Um, so you can build a much bigger code across all the data blocks around an entire revolution um, and use old, and use uh, message passing to try and recover that as you would for the, the smaller blocks. Mm. And that's totally impractical. Of course, unless you recognize that most of the data blocks are correct and you don't need to consider them. So there's a way you can ignore those data blocks and just process the data blocks that have problems. Um, so it's like having a very large data block um, consuming the entire track. And this sort of thing, I mean, it, it's not very nice in that um, you have to do read, modify, writes and things like that. But if you're talking about very large blocks, which you, I think you necessarily are with shingled recording, if you're talking with very, very large chunks of data, then that's fine. And that's exactly the sort of thing you want. 
And then shingle recording we've talked about a little bit more and uh, two dimensional recording we've talked about. And I, I have to give credit to John Coke. And I'll do that again on the next chart, I think, which is this one. Uh, there's a picture of a happy, smiling John Coker, and he played a really major role in, um, in various aspects, both for shingle recording and two-dimensional magnetic recording. Um, he was the driving force between, behind a lot of the activities. Uh, he really promoted these ideas and uh, flew from place to place, talking to people and making sure things actually happened. Uh, and he played a major role in defining the data architecture and created a prototype. And he was behind this, another, um, this is the SMR drive uh, that he created um, and gave me a nice souvenir of that. And I think I've just got one more uh, thing to wave in front of the camera in a moment, but uh, yes. Um, uh, unfortunately, again, Seagate shipped ahead of us, I think. And, uh, Tom, you had some comments on that again? Well, yes, we have a difficult time describing what constitutes a first shipment for measurement basis. And, uh, you know, if you go back to RAMAC, right, IBM shipped its first, quote, RAMAC disk drive in June of 56. But that was a not a production model. They didn't actually ship production until November of '57. So what do you count? Shipment of a prototype, uh, your uh, Proto Six. If it had been a product, what do you count those that shipped out to your beta sites, or do you wait for uh, an actual production unit shipped to a paying customer? Uh, and lot, most companies don't tell us exactly when that happened. So in this particular case. Uh, Seagate announced, as you uh, said, that uh, uh, now I'm confused. Uh, I think that September date you did say was correct. And then the, the, we'll talk about uh, TDMR in a minute. It was the same sort of disappointment with TDMR okay. because I think. Uh, we're not well, quite sure right. whether to get shipped early or not. Yeah, actually, we that is the date. Thank you, uh, Roger. That's the date in September. They announced they'd already shipped a million drives. So we really don't know when the first batch shipped. Yeah. yeah. Right. That gets to, if you're going to mark, you know, measurement. Yes, by September, they had shipped a million drives. Now, you know, uh, that's could be several months or even a year of shipment. We just don't know. Yeah. And uh, SMR is out there now, but uh, it's taken a long time to gain customer acceptance. And uh, I don't know if we talked about this briefly, Tom, but there's been a bit of a scandal recently uh, over SMR. Uh, scandal isn't the right word, but uh, apparently all three companies and WD, Seagate, and Toshiba have been shipping shingle recording in their products without telling the customer. And it has certain uh, performance attributes, some of which are not very desirable for shingle recording. Um, and uh, this is, it, it becomes apparent in certain applications that the performance is not what it should be. Uh, but that seemed very underhand to me to not uh, specify that it's a shingled architecture uh, because you've got to take special provision over how the data is handled on off the drive. Uh, oh, so that was it. And that's happened just within the last week or so. Yeah, the, 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 the shingled magnetic recording affects access time. And so it depends upon how they specify the access time. The, the problem is a shingle magnetic recording drive really looks more like a tape drive than a disk drive. It, you know, cause well, you it's well hidden. Run. And <laughs> disk drives, you know, yeah. disk drives, in theory, you can update a single 4K block, 4,000 bytes, you know, yeah. whereas a tape drive, you tend to write megabytes or gigabytes uh, at a time. And in an SMR drive, if you're writing very large blocks, you won't notice it. But if you're writing a 
small block, it's going to be a horrendous impact on access time. And so, yeah. if they didn't, there's there's two ways of doing uh, shingle recording. One is to have the host look after it, the computer look oh, after it. Sure. And and the other is to have the drive look after it. Of course. And that's apparently what's happening now that they've hidden the SMR inside the drive, so it looks like a normal drive. Well, that's and, uh, in most applications, it works just fine. Um, the, the all the data is staged as you write it onto the drive, so it's written immediately onto the drive, and it's just later on that it has to be shuffled around. And it's it's the situation where the drive is almost full and being used heavily. That's when it sort of falls apart. Um, well, again, but, uh, uh, yeah. I think I think from what we've learned over the last week or so, all the drive, all the desktop drives and the mobile drives are shingled recording now. So it really has become, uh, you know, the way that these drives are made now. Well, uh, again, it gets to access time uh, and specification of access time as to whether there's any misrepresentation going on. But, you know, like the, the, the drive on your laptop as we speak, on my desktop as we speak, as access time doesn't matter. It's got lots of time right now to do lots of things. But if you're going to put put it into a uh, access time intensive application where you're writing many small blocks, reasonably small blocks, uh, shingle magnetic recording, whether it's drive managed or well, if it's drive managed, your access time is going to be very erratic. If it's host managed, presumably the host will block things up and only write very large blocks, in which case the uh, access time is irrelevant because the time to transfer a large block is very, very long. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's uh, the access, gist of the problem. Uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Access time is usually fine, except when the drive gets full and when it's being heavily used. That's when it sort of starts to fall apart. But otherwise, I mean, you can write the data immediately on the disk. It's always staged. And you can get the data off the disk just the same as you can with a conventional drive. But when, Until, but when you have to start shuffling the data around and there's no time to do it and you have to do a lot of shuffling because the drive is nearly full, then it no. becomes a problem. I think we're saying the same thing in two different ways. When yes, it's, time it, is it's very application dependent. Yeah, it's when access time. time is important, the uh, shingle magnetic recording will fall apart. Yes. Yeah. You have, particularly in write. Uh, you know, what's happened is disk drives used to be simple addressed. You wrote a block which had a very specific address and unless it was a, a defect you could pretty much find the data at that location but when you get into a SMR drive managed drive your data are placed wherever there happens to be an availability uh, particularly as you do update rights. I mean you know you, things just get moved all around. That means you've got a file system on the disk drive not just a simple access method, and as your accesses go up, the performance drops dramatically. So if you're, uh, as you and I today sitting here, it doesn't matter. But if I were doing a uh, uh, a, a graphics design on my computer, making lots of changes, uh, the performance might go to fall down completely. And if this drive were plugged into a server, it would really go down. So uh, it is, you know, it is how they represent it. And I haven't read the complaints yet, but there may be a an argument of, for misrepresentation. Uh, and we should, the, we should the more, move along, Tom. The more interesting thing about shingle magnetic recording is, again, uh, it gave us somewhat of a boost in capacity, but that's it. It was a one-time boost as opposed to other technology changes which have allowed an ongoing increase. Uh, we got yeah, about shingle recording, yeah, shingle recording tends to be more valuable at higher densities. Uh, so it buys you very little at low densities, but as we've been pushing densities, it's been become more valuable. So, it, I mean, they claim numbers like 25%, but I think in reality it's more like 10 or 15%. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. It's, in, it's uh, been a 10 to 25 percent boost in in density, uh, and uh, you know that's it. We're, you know it's now a more or less standard process, uh, and uh, it doesn't it's not 
going to give us any more capacity aerial density increase. All right, we should move along. We should move along. <laughs> I don't know what my next chart is, but I'm going to move to it. Oh, we're going to talk oh, about your collaborating Rochester. with the Rochester Group. Yeah. But this yeah. is San Jose, isn't it? Yes. This is in San Jose at one of the internal uh, conferences uh, held at the SanDisk uh, Auditorium. Um, but these are actually the three key folks that I collaborated with. Uh, all three of them brilliant. Um, uh, the person, the gentleman, where's my pointer? The gentleman, here we go. This gentleman here, Rick Galbraith, uh, is now a Western Digital Fellow. Um, and he's, he's got like a hundred at least patents or more um, and has been one of the key architects of the channels. Uh, I guess uh, IBM, Hitachi, WD don't actually do channels as much uh, as such. Uh, they re rely on vendors, but pretty much, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but a lot of the key features in the vendor channels come from this gentleman, basically. Um, Niranjay uh, Ravindran here, um, I think he's a, uh, one of the uh, students from the um, University of Minnesota, but uh, again, he's done some amazing work. Um, and then the gentleman here, you can't see terribly well at the back, uh, Jonas Good, uh, again, uh, outstanding person both theoretically but also very hands-on he actually designs algorithms and brings up the drives and tests them out uh, the other attribute uh, is that he is a champion wrestler uh, there's some particular category of, of wrestling um, that he's famous for he wins competitions he travels all around the world all around the world and uh, very often he's he's the winner of the competition um so it, it, he's uh, an interesting personality as well so i was very lucky to be able to work with those those folks uh, it says rochester team but actually jonas is based in uh, in uh, los angeles so, um, so not just looks, the rochester team this looks like the uh Almaden cafeteria no it's not it's, it's the not. Uh, it's the sand disc uh, Oh, okay. sitting outside the SanDisk Auditorium. Hmm. And that, <laughs> it's funny, I notice it now, but that black blob at the front in the foreground is my trusty briefcase, which I still use. I don't have it in this room, but uh, I've been carrying that thing around for the last 20 years, probably, and had it repaired numerous times because things keep breaking on it. But <laughs> yes, that's, that's a funny memory. Sorry, that's a distraction. You said TDMR did eventually ship, but was Western Digital first or not first? Um, well, I don't know. Um, let me say first, though, it, it, it was nothing like we imagined what finally shipped. It's very difficult to, to make an array of heads, heads immediately side by side. So we stack them on top of each other, as you can see here. Um, down track, so you get some lateral separation across track just by virtue of it changing skew. Um, and the channel, there's no two-dimensional detection. It's just a pair of equalizers combining the signals from the two readers and feeding it into a conventional detector. And that sort of understates the, the complexity and the architecture of it, but very different to what we originally imagined. And it's, I think, one of the reasons why the game is not, not anything like what we, we hoped for. But did we ship first? No, I, I don't know. You can, you can correct me in a minute, but I remember being so disappointed at uh, TMRC 2017. Fatih Erdan was the Seagate gentleman we'd been collaborating, well, not collaborating, but uh, um, we were um, interacting uh, through the uh, INSIC or whatever the successor was. Uh, but uh, Fatih Erden stood up at the beginning of the TMRC 2017 uh, and said, "You can take TMRC, you can take TDMR off your list of technologies. When are they going to ship?" Question on the questionnaire, because Seagate, we have been shipping it 
uh, for months now. We have shipped thousands or millions of them. Um, so I was very disappointed to hear that. We didn't ship until a little bit later. But Tom, you had some other comments about this. Again, getting back to how do you measure shipment, uh, indeed, they did announce something at the uh, conference in 2017, but they didn't, Seagate did not announce general availability of the product until third quarter of the next year, almost a year later, or more than a year later, when four products were announced as readily available. That is the Iron Wolf, Iron Wolf Pro, Barracuda Pro, Skyhawk, and I guess another one, the uh, Ex Exos TM. Products, each product targeted at a different market segment. So that's third quarter 2018 before you could buy one either as a, an OEM customer or a retail customer. Western Digital, on the other hand, announced limited production six months earlier, or up about six months earlier, in the second quarter 2018. The uh, well, uh, Western Digital was in shipment. So what was the first customer shipment? And as we would ordinarily measure it from a production line to a paying customer, who knows? But you were, if you weren't first, you were very close. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel a lot better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that was good. Um, so, mm -hmm. I, I think in 2017, you decided to retire. But before we talk about your post-retirement okay. work, I'd like to jump back to 1998 when you published a paper uh, which predicted an ultimate limit of about one terabit per square inch uh, as a way of uh, setting context for discussing the paper. I prepared this chart which uh, shows aerial density trend lines and the two things, first of all, let me tell you about the chart. Uh, it really looks at the entire industry. And in the first couple of decades, it's basically IBM leading uh, aerial density. So you, if you want to get a trend line, you connect the dots between the IBM announcement products, like starting with the 350 and going to a variety of products. And you can see in the first three decades from 57, if you want to use your pointer to follow my language, Roger, from about the IBM 350 and 57, going up until the early 90s, the, the industry was poor, more or less following Moore's Law, doubling every 24 months or so. But getting, beginning about the early 80s, the density rate of increase had fallen off to almost doubling every two years. But then there's a kink in the curve. And now I'm not looking at all IBM HDDs, but really at the whole industry. And in beginning in the late 80s and up until the mid 90s and late 90s, the rate increased at a higher rate till by the time you wrote the paper in uh, 1998, the aerial density was doubling almost once a year. A few years, years later, Gordon Moore, the author of Moore's Law, Call this extraordinary. So here you are in 1998, and if you look at the lower dotted line, historically, back to 1957, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, the industry was, was increasing at about doubling its aerial density every two years. Uh, and if you followed that lower dotted line, you'd see you'd hit a terabit per inch squared sometime before 2018. On the other hand, if you looked at the more recent aerial density increases occurring in the 90s, if you follow the dotted line up, you might hit a terabit per square inch around 2002, 2004. So Roger, at this time in 1998, looking at the history, looking at the technology, you write this paper that says one terabit per square inch, that's the end of this trend. How was that received? Looking at this chart, Tom, you the the top end here is one terabit per square inch, that's but we didn't know, we didn't know that we didn't know how far it would go. But that's what you and said. And so, about. the the task was to figure out 
what was the what was the limit um and it was again a lot of this was associated with the uh, insic organization and some of the key names there mike mallory mason williams randy victoria dave thompson there, there was actually a host of people involved in these these discussions um and i got very interested in this whole topic of what are the what's the physics what's what's the physical limits of, the, of recording and uh, so i set about trying to figure that out and uh, looked at uh, you know there's noise from the head there's uh, magnetic noise in the head there's thermal noise in the head uh, there's noise in the media um, and uh, what what's what are the limitations how how far can you really push things um, and i think the first thing that came out of this was that you probably could not get very far with longitudinal recording um, so it had to be perpendicular recording and I put a, a story together um, with perpendicular recording with limits to the grain size um, due to the, the thermal stability of the recording medium and, and also data rate primarily because of gyromagnetic effects and remarkably uh, doing this in 1998 uh, both of these have come true the aerial density is stuck at one terabit per square inch and the data rate is stuck at three gigabits per second um so it, <laughs> more more by luck than, than judgment but it's it's worked out very well uh the following year i tried to put together a a straw man product uh, <laughs> with these at one terabit per square inch. And it's interesting to, to see, um, I, I, won't, I won't go through this item by item, but some of the things are totally off base and some of them are really spot on. Um, so the, the things that, that's totally off base, and there's some excuse for this, the disk drive was a terabyte drive. Um, it was, I think, a one-inch disc. Can't remember now, but I think it was a one-inch diameter, spinning at twenty-three thousand RPM. Um, and this, this was all because at, at that point in time we had no idea about flash memory. We wanted to build a super high-performance drive, so we wanted extremely low access time. So we wanted the very high RPM, the very fast actuator, which arises from miniaturization as well. Uh, but that, of course, is totally off base because flash memories come in and taking all that part of the market. We don't even make 15K RPM drives anymore. Um, so that was way off. But uh, most, a lot of the other things were, were spot on. The, the, the grain diameter is, is pretty much spot on. And uh, one thing that is also very close, um, and uh, I when when I when it came to spelling out the magnetic spacing, uh, which is a, really a very critical parameter in figuring out what linear density uh, you, you can achieve, uh, I talked to Frank Tolke at um, UCSD, at CMRR UCSD, and he thought a bit and came back with a number, uh, and he he budgeted it quite carefully. Uh, you know what's the limit of uh, carbon thicknesses, what's the limit of physical spacing and air separation. Um, and the answer was six and a half nanometers. And that is almost spot on as well. That's, uh, it may have changed a little bit, but that's pretty much where it was uh, when I left, um, when I retired in uh, 2017. Six and a half nanometers of magnetic spacing. And the physical clearance is about a nanometer or less six and a half with all the carbon overcoats and everything. So uh, that was spot on. Thank you very much to Frank Tolkien. So which, which, which of those, let's go back. So this not, is not Mike's space drive, here. Not to your drive, but to your future limits. Um, uh -huh. They're still there, right? I mean, which, there's none of them have we come up with uh, technologies that will allow us to continue increasing aerial density at a high rate? They're all there. 
Yes, uh, and it, it's a question of, I mean, this, this was uh, stated as being conventional recording. It, it was, to, to, I think I said, I, I hedged my, my words. I think I said to the nearest that the limit will be of the order of one terabit per square inch, uh, which gives you a lot of latitude, but it's, it's come out pretty much exactly. And uh, shingle recording and TDMR add just a little bit to that. And you, you know, it's debatable whether you call it conventional recording still. And the data rate, uh, I think I, I underestimated that. I think we could push that higher. But uh, fortuitously, perhaps, um, the, the, um, the, the linear density is limited and the velocity hasn't really been pushed because um, we, we haven't tried to do 10k RPM or 15k RPM, three and a half inch drives. The, the media velocity has stayed quite moderate at 30 to 40 meter, meters per second. Uh, so there hasn't really been a great need to push the, the data rate. Um, but yes, they're, they're both about right. When you say the future limits, when you, when you say thermal stability, there you're talking about grain size. Uh, yes, and the, the head as well, uh, we were looking at, you have to make sure that the magnetic noise in the head, which is also thermally excited, doesn't become excessive. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very close to being a problem. Um, and so that, that will limit future, right? if we manage to improve the media by doing hammer or something like that, uh, the reed head's going to get a problem. Well, it's sort of the, you know, what, what's the, it used to be, you know, before we got down to these low limits, that system design was about 60% uh, noise, media noise, 10 or 15% electronic noise, a few percentage for the head. You know, and that was, that was your noise budget. You know, it was media dominated noise budgets. And you, you know. It's a, it's a little bit different to look at after equalization, the head noise, the white noise becomes not predominant, but much more significant mm -hmm. uh, after equalization. And, you know, I notice on your little future limit chart there, uh, micro actuator technology, the other side of that is how narrow can you make the head? I mean, is it the, yes. Yeah. There's sort of an issue there, right? Is it going to be the uh, photolithography is well beyond the the the, the uh, radial dimensions, much smaller than the uh, uh, positioning. So you think it's going to be the mechanical limits that are going to hold us, even if we can find a better uh, media and a better no, head? I don't no, I don't see any mechanical limitations, not not from a physics point of view. Um, and we, we talked about this a little bit. I, I guess I, I made the claim, probably erroneously, that it's not surprising that HDD aerial densities go at 40% per year because that's Moore's limit and that's, that's, the, sem that's the semiconductor technology rate. So the lithography goes at that rate. So you can make heads and silicon sort of increasing at that rate. Um, and it's only when you run into roadblocks, um, and you pointed out the, the transition from particulate media to thin film media. Uh, I think one of the big transitions was from inductive readback to uh, magnetoresistive readback, and then GMR and then TMR. I think that's been a big factor in allowing us to continue. There's... And then there's a, there's a host of things, isn't there, Tom? If you think about the writing process as well, I mean, you have to be able to write high coercivities. You need high moment pole tips, etc. So there's a whole host of things, but uh, yeah, it, it's difficult to, to pin down exactly what the, the limits are at each stage. And uh, in our conversations, uh, I have suggested that the improvements in electronics have also been um, at times uh, barriers that have been removed uh, which were precluding uh, rapid advances in technology. I mean, why, if, if you can, I think we agree the lithography really hasn't been an issue almost ever, right? I mean, the one nice thing 
uh, and a colleague of ours pointed out about lithography in the head, you can make a bunch of heads and throw the ones out that don't work if your lithography is noisy. I mean, on a, in a uh, NAND chip or a DRAM chip, every bit has to be accurate. But if you're making a, a wafer of heads and your lithography is a little uncertain, fine, you'll make some bad, some good. It'll increase your cost of the head, but you can finally select the head that will work in a disk drive at the aerial density you want. But if your lithography is good enough, you'll get a very high yield. So I, I would argue lithography has not been a limiting, ever a limiting factor. The technology has <laughs> always been way beyond what we've needed. I, do, I, I don't think the head team would agree with that at they all. They would time. not. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say they would not. Yeah. As, as grain size is today, we've hit a limit. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there's, I don't think it's ever been, uh, I mean, the argument for thin film heads was lithography would be cheaper than machined ferrite with metal and gap. And it may be true that they were cheaper, but you could still machine a head for a long time yeah. before the, some of the head industry went to lithography. So, yeah. you know, but the thing I think it's probably, probably true to say now with the, the heads that there is, there are lithographic processes available that could create smaller structures. It's just that we can't take advantage of them because we can't that, do more than one terabit per square inch. That's exactly my point. We can't, we cannot not only not make the bit cells smaller, we can't make it smaller in any dimension. Yeah. <laughs> given yeah. the mechanical problems of a servo. So lithography is yeah. not, if we could make a better servo and a smaller disc, Lithography would not be the limiting factor. It might, in fact, be the magnetization of the head, the ability to generate the field, uh, or the signal out of the uh, the the uh, reader. It wouldn't be lithography. the only dimension. Yeah, the only dimension that has been pushed successfully recently uh, has been the discs per inch, ver stacked vertically on the spindle. That's true. That's that's gone up a lot. And the and actually the. the, the the NAND flash guys are in the same boat because the way they're increasing their density is stacking the NAND, uh, the, the gates higher. They've gone from uh, uh, essentially you know, four layers to 128 layers. They're going vertical too. The question is how high can they go? Make, makes me very jealous, does that? It's not something you can do with uh, magnetic recording. And that, we'll talk about that in a moment, perhaps. Well, I, I mean, if, if things keep going the way we're going, you might resurrect the five and a quarter inch disks we could go longitudinally also. There have but, been attempts to do that, believe me. But, so, uh, both, interesting... As I understand it, both Seagate and WD or HGST have had five and a quarter inch projects that uh, neither succeeded. Well, Quantum did it, actually came out with a product 20 years ago, Bigfoot, and it never went any places, mainly, yes, be right. <laughs> mainly because Again, against the 40% per year improvement, Bigfoot didn't offer very much, and it didn't fit into the racks and stuff like that. Yeah. But today, with and that's actually probably a good introduction to the next slide, yeah. with aerial density having stopped going at Moore's Law rates. So here we have uh, all the highest production aerial density, basically um, starting with Jim Porter's data, and then just taking the announcements as various com companies announce them and picking the leading, if not always the highest, as people have announced various products. And you can see it almost looks like an exponential decay, right? I mean, we're, we were doubling every 18 months towards the end of uh, uh, the last decade. This decade, it slowed down to 28 per month, and now, you know, we're talking uh, eight to 10 years between the doubling of aerial density. Uh, your one, t that dotted line is the one terabit per square inch that you predicted would be the limit in 1998, and uh, your prediction looks uh, spot on. <laughs> Yeah, the ones that are above the line, I can argue, are, are probably shingle recording TDMR. So well, it's still, it's still, you know, I mean, we don't do things, 
And we went from uh, FM to MFM to 27 to PRML. We don't care about the code or the recording process. I mean, shingle recording is just a, another way of getting more aerial density. And there have been, I mean, extraordinary changes in technology from the RAM Act to the disk drives along that one terabit per square inch line. Uh, shingle recording being uh, one of the many technologies. But if you're going 40% per year, 20% improvement from uh, shingle recording is nine months. Used to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, that would give us nine months. Now, you know, what's, yeah. you know, how are we going to keep going? We're not. It's really been, I, I don't think there's been a new high density announcement uh, in several months now. I mean, it used to be you got a new product every three or four months. You know, somebody pushed think, the limit. Just to put this in context, I suppose uh, probably most people are aware, but there are two contenders for increasing aerial density beyond this limit. One is so-called hammer, that's a heat assisted one, and MAMA is a microwave assisted one. In both cases, the idea is to uh, make available extra energy, if you like, that's sometimes called energy assisted magnetic recording. But it's to uh, enable, is to allow more energy to be available during the writing process so that you can write higher coercivity, higher energy particles, um, which can be made smaller. So it, first of all, it depends on being able to make a hammer head, which isn't maybe that easy, or a hammer system, um, uh, or a mamma head. Uh, but the other thing is, of course, you have to make a small grain media successfully uh, at those high coercivities. And that involves typically, but depends which system, but typically involves a huge change in the material system uh, on the disk. Um, and uh, controlling the grain size and getting the grain size to where it needs to be. Uh, so both those things have to happen. And I think the story at the moment is that systems have been put together, hammer systems have been put together, and uh, media has been made, uh, hammer media has been made. Uh, but I think they're still struggling with reliability issues in the hammer head, lifetime issues in the in the hammer head, uh, and the ability to control the meat, make good small grain hammer media um, is is not straightforward. Uh, Mama may be a little bit easier, but uh, doesn't maybe offer some such large gains as as hammer would. Oh, so I think initially Hammer was thought to have an extra order of magnitude, which would take you up to 10 terabits per square inch. But I think those estimates, that speculation is uh, drawn back to maybe a factor of two. Well, the square root of 10 would say, you know, that's how much smaller the grain size yeah. has to get, because I think your analysis starts with it, you know, from a signal noise ratio eight grains per bit, that's dimensionless, right? That's sort of where you are. Maybe you get to seven, but ultimately you get to one, but we don't, in theory, you can get to a bit pattern media, but we don't know how to do, do that either. So if you're, if you're going to continue to have a bit cell having some number of grains, you're probably going to hit a limit at six or seven. Would you agree with that? Eight, somewhere uh, yes, it's, it's, it's interesting, and we've talked about this before, but uh, the reed head, of course, is only about half the width of the track. So if you look at what's happening underneath the reed head, uh, and if you look at the channel bits rather than the customer bits, then each channel bit, as seen by the reed head, has about four grains in it. Okay. And so that we... was the number that was used uh, in that uh, 10 terabit per square inch paper. And in your one terabit, it was more like um, eight? I'd yes. Think. Yes, it, it would have been because it was an eight nanometer grain pitch. So it would have been eight or ten. So the point is we're, we're, we're near some fundamental level. 
if you're going to increase by an order of magnitude. But an order of magnitude is what? Uh, if you're doubling every two years, that's uh, uh, six years? I'm, I'm very skeptical whether either Hammer or Mammer will do anything useful, but we will see. Uh, It'll be interesting to follow well, then, this. You know, then you're, you know, then the only way we can lower the cost for a bit is either going vertically or horizontally. And it's tough to lower the cost for a bit as the industry fix as the industry shrinks, the fixed costs have got to be absorbed over a smaller number of units. So that makes it even more difficult. Yeah. So where do you that think that counts heavily against hammer as well, because it's more expensive. So where do you feel, which is sort of a, you know, where do you think the hard to strive industry is going just slow growth in aerial density and consequential marketing issues? No, I think it's pretty much stopped. I don't think it is going to increase. I'm very skeptical that either Hammer or Mammal will come to a reality. Okay. Well, the, <clears throat> so you, basically then the uh, cost per megabyte is going to decline sort of along a learning curve, curve number. Yeah, not very fast. Not very fast. Four, five, ten percent a year, maybe as, as we get better. Yeah, but volumes are probably going to shrink as well, which complicates mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I've always been a pessimist, though. Yeah, that way okay. I'm pleasantly surprised when things work out better than I expect. How about tape? What's your forecast for there? The aerial density is near ours, but of course their media is much worse than ours. Uh, yes, I, I, it seems to me that this, they're still a long way from being at any physical limit and they're still using particulate media. Uh, so it, yeah, there's probably a lot more, a um, lot more growth available on, on tape. Well, I'm not sure the, the, their limit may be, uh, in something that I consider as a problem would, would be in the, uh, uh, tape di tape head interface. Uh, it's just not a very stable medium, and so flying height has a huge impact on magnetic recording. And the thinner you make the recordings to make the recording layer to make the uh, uh, higher performance media, the more problems you have with wear. So I think they may be fighting flying, even though theoretically the aerial density is not near what could be achieved from the particle limitations, the, the, the head tape interface problems, wear and flying height may keep them at a, uh, a, a much lower aerial density we are, meaning their costs will also not keep lowering at the same rate it's been lowering in the past. Yeah, possibly, maybe even probably, but uh, there are engineering limits, they're not physical limits. True. So, leaving the, the industry, you've now retired. Uh, I understand you had a nice retirement party. The last of my props, let me put this up. There's been a tradition in, uh, in uh, IBM, I guess, and it's carried over. Uh, this this probably won't show up at all well, but there's been a tradition. <laughs> Can this be seen? Oh yes, oh, round and uh, round. There's been a tradition. Uh, one Terry Whittier, a technician at IBM, uh, has got a stack of 14-inch brown discs, and the tradition is that every, you probably couldn't see that when I held it up, but. And uh, there's names on these things. Uh, oh. People sign them with a scribing instrument. So I have a, probably a hundred or more names on this thing <laughs> of the folks I've worked with. So that's a, that's a really nice uh, souvenir to have. And it, again, it emphasizes how far we've come, isn't it? From 14 inch brown discs to uh, what we do today. It's amazing. But yes, I, I retired, uh, what does this chart say? Mainly being lazy, yes, that's about right. Although Tom has been making me work very hard putting my uh, my oral history together. No, I would um, disagree I, with that. 
I've given this talk uh, on uh, this uh, zooming in on data storage. Uh, I've given that talk uh, quite a few times, and that's that's interesting to do. I've enjoyed doing that. It's uh, uh, not a very technical talk. It, it, it talks about um, tries to involve data storage as you go from the extremes of very large distances to very small distances. Um, we've got a university project. Uh, it relates to what we said earlier, trying to move into that third dimension, put multiple layers of magnet magnetic data on top of each other. Mm. And uh, that's still going. At, uh, it's, it's the University of Washington, or Washington State University, I should say, and uh, Nanjing University or Nanjing Institute of Technology. Um, and it's it's really going nowhere to be honest but it's it's a good training ground for students but the reality is you can't get anything useful from any anything but the top layer uh, the other layers are too far away to either write properly on or read properly on um so yeah, i mean at the moment they, they they have a paper they put together which i think says 20 percent gain or 10 percent gain but, uh, you know, that assumes you can build two layers of perfect recording medium with exactly the right characteristics on top of each other. Um, and then you, you have know, to focus the magnetic reading. And you try to somehow um, focus the magnetic reading. I mean, I mean yeah, you, optical you guys try it. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they can focus yeah, light. You, yeah, you need to be an X-rays or gamma rays to get into the poor part where, where we need to be. Um, yeah, the only thing is, and I, I did look into this quite seriously at one point, can you do some sort of, you've heard about racetrack memory? Um, oh, yes. I forget the gentleman's name now, but is, is there some way Stuart you could Parker. write? Yes, Stuart, yes, thank you. Um, is there some way you can write on one layer, on the top layer, presumably, and transfer it down into lower layers? And there are various physical mechanisms you can imagine trying to do that with, hmm. and then sort of bring it back up to the surface when you want to read it back. I see. Um, but there's nothing practical that you can, you can do. And then the other thing there is the Computer History Museum. And uh, I've had fun uh, with, with that involvement. I've written a bunch of Wikipedia pages that we mentioned before. I've written a couple of milestones. And uh, the big project has been this project with Tom. And uh, is, is this the point, Tom, where I should thank you very graciously for all the work you put in, into doing this? It's been quite a remarkable experience. And you, you must have spent hours and hours on this, because I know you've been looking through all the boxes of stuff uh, that I gave you as well. So thank you very much, Tom. And thanks to the computer history Museum, too. But much appreciated. Well, Roger, I have to thank you. Uh... This has been an unusual oral history. I've not had, had the privilege and, and really pleasure of working with someone who's been so thorough in preparing for his oral history. Uh, the 30 some odd slides uh, we've collaborated on, but uh, uh, it is unusual. I've not experienced that before. Uh, I've had other people prepare exhibits, but not to the extent that uh, you've been, and they've been made it made it very uh, easy to uh, for me to moderate. And I've had fun uh, fact checking you from time to time. <laughs> yes. Uh, for the record, I'd note that uh, uh, Roger has uh, offered the museum three boxes of physical documents going back to his Ampex days through his uh, Western Digital days. Um, and uh, in so far, I have 218 soft copy documents that Roger has offered, copies, soft copies of his many presentations, um, many of which uh, don't exist in any other repository other than Roger's garage, and uh, a bunch of copies of his many papers most of which are online or available in hard copy form, but uh, all of which, along with uh, the recordings of uh, these interviews and the slides used, will be offered to the museum. And they will be researchable 
under the uh, uh, code A2020.7556. That's the code number that the museum will use to record Roger's offering, and most of which I would expect would wind up in the museum's permanent collection. So uh, I thank you, Roger, and I go looking what we've talked about. The next slide kind of summarizes the uh, mm. um, where we've come from uh, Saltaire in Yorkshire, the UK, to retirement here in Gilroy. Uh, and along the way, I picked up three nice children. Jeremy, Julie, and Alistair, and uh, I remarried Pauline, and uh, by now I have four lovely grandchildren, and uh, the next, and, and my sister, of course, uh, still in England, and the next slide, I think, is the, yes, my nice Thanksgiving from uh, last year, with uh, all the people mentioned there, my four grandchildren, uh, my sister, uh, there's five miscellaneous spouses, not all, not all mine, of course, but uh, between the, the group. But uh, yes, uh, it's it's uh, it's been a, a wonderful uh, adventure, I guess, my career and my family and uh, everything. And hopefully, I've got a few years left. <laughs> we'll see what the COVID nineteen has to say about that. <laughs> Shouldn't joke about it. Well, sheltering in place. That's uh, yeah. one way to avoid it. We're a little out of sync. I was going to ask you uh, about comparing uh, uh, IBM. Uh, oh, yeah. U.S. versus Japan, and uh, um, you know, to be honest, I haven't really taken that much notice of my surroundings. I've, I've always been focused on on what I what I've been working on, uh, what I've been enjoying. Um, IBM, IBM was very IBM. I remember when I joined, um, I, I was, I was quite amazed at how, how much everything was organized, probably well organized, but it was very organized and people were very IBM-ish. Uh, I remember when I joined, there was, there were three people, um, and I, I kept getting confused, confused as to which was which because they seemed somehow so similar and so IBM-ish. And they were, uh, Jim Bellison was one of them, uh, Roy Jensen, and uh, Larry Rosier. Uh, and it was, it was funny <laughs> because they all seemed so similar to me. It was a strange very strange experience, but I think that that's true of IBM, that people were there for an entire career, typically, and they became somehow very IBM-ish. They all had the same sort of outlook, same ideas, um, followed the same rules, etc. It, it was interesting. And Hitachi, things didn't change a lot in Hitachi. I think I enjoyed Hitachi most out of all of these company. No, maybe Ampex most, but Hitachi as well. Um, Hitachi followed, tried to emulate, I think, IBM in, in many ways. And a lot of the structure was the same. One of the, the most interesting things I noticed was the difference between um, IBM research and Hitachi research. And I, I, I'm exaggerating, but I tried to encapsulate it this way at IBM research, Almaden Research Center. There's a whole bunch of uh, researchers, individual contributors, and they would all be heading in different directions. They would all be researching different things in different directions. And if you looked at the, uh, the research going on in, in Odawara, the research group there, they were all following the same direction. They were all in lockstep as a team heading in one direction. And I don't know which is best. I mean, it may have been the wrong direction that they were all heading in. But, uh, but they were going they, in the direction. There's a certain difference. You might, switch to the next, you might switch to the next slide and get rid of the laser. 
Okay. Um, and then WD, there was this funny whole separate thing, so things didn't change very much with, with WD. But it, it got quite unpleasant at the end in the sense that they, uh, they were getting rid of all the nice offices that we had. Um, and uh, they, they were merging the, the groups. I think the media team kind of quite unhappy in some ways. So the uh, HGST media team got merged with the WD media team and changed locations and stuff. And I know there was quite a bit of uh, upset about that. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not sure. As I say, I haven't noticed much difference really. Mm -hmm. I've been very observant, just sort of gone through life. Perhaps. So you really didn't see the WD side then of how they did their development and research compared to the way uh, you found Hitachi and IBM mm -hmm. were similar, and uh, mm -hmm. but you weren't WD. Uh, I guess you weren't. Yeah, there, there wasn't. Long yeah, there wasn't really a, a research effort at WD. Mm -hmm. uh, not not as not what I would call research. There was development and maybe advanced development. Um, but that was a trend. I mean, the, the uh, Hitachi research department, the HGST research department, was disbanded as well. So, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about the uh, history museum and the storage sig. What, how's oh. that been going for you? <laughs> well, that's been fun. We have a monthly meeting, and the main emphasis has been on creating oral histories. Uh, so I, I've done my part here, and I'm supposed to do one in future on the, on the Ampex PRML plus the IBM PRML, so that, that will be fun as well. Um, but yes, it's been an enjoyable interaction, that. Um, and there are several people, of course, I knew uh, prior to joining that group. Dennis Mee is a regular participant, uh, Chris Bajoric and uh, others. So that, that's been fun. Um, so it's have, kept kept me occupied. Have you taken your grandchildren to the museum? Uh, have I? No, I've taken my sister. My sister was delighted because her boss was there, or a, a, a picture of her boss about 30 feet high was there because her boss was giving one of these sort of invited lectures really? on something or other. <laughs> <laughs> but she, yes, she wasn't expecting that. So we walked in there and she was uh, confronted with this enormous, enormous mural of her former boss. Okay. So if we move to the next slide, I think I'd like to thank you for uh, the time an effort you've put into it's been as i've said a few seconds ago really for me an enjoyable experience uh, a level of detail that uh, i've not experienced many times in these oral histories and actually uh, frankly it's going to make my editing of the transcript a lot easier because we've gone to a lot of effort to uh, um, make things consistent coherent and clear so Thanks, Roger. It's been a lot of fun. Stay safe in Gilroy. I'll say stay safe here in uh, Los Altos Hills. Likewise, Tom. Thank you so much for organizing all this and putting all the work in that you have. And uh, as, I, as you say, I really enjoyed the interaction as well. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome and goodbye. Goodbye.